it's Adam from Lucid Pixel, and I'm kind of lucky today because I have a very distinguished panel of YouTubers, teachers, and people I have a lot of affection for uh, here with us today. Uh, we have Hardy Fowler, we have Kelsey Rodriguez, Steven Zapata, uh, we have Antonio Stepertz from Artwad, and we have Tyler Edlin. And Istabrak. She's not, she doesn't Hello. have a video today, but uh, she's, she's here to join the, the call as well. And uh, we're going to be talking about something that I feel is underrepresented, unfortunately, AI art. I don't think we talk about that enough, especially on my channel. Uh, and that was my attempt at humor. <laughs> I'm, sick and tired to, I'm sick and tired of the subject, but, but as the subject evolves, it's evolving so quickly and things are moving so fast that... Um, yeah, it's, it's kind of hard to keep up at certain points. So um, the whole reason I'm here, the whole reason I invited all of these guests uh, on, on my channel today is because I think we all have our own particular angle. Everybody kind of has their own take, some more positive, some more negative, some are more technical, some are more philosophical and personal. So I kind of wanted, I wanted to get a bunch of people together, but under the banner of people that I consider Everybody on this channel is somebody who, everybody who's in this podcast today are people who I find do a beautiful job dedicating their lives to the betterment of other people, to help other people suffer less. Um, so I have a lot of respect for everybody here, uh, teachers and YouTubers and just awesome people all around. I thought I'd get the conversation started. I sent you guys out some, uh, some notes earlier this week, but um, I wanted to uh, start with and I apologize, I'm not a professional interviewer or anything like that, so I'm reading notes, which is kind of a good plot. Um, no, it's okay. But I wanted to kind of go around the board a little bit, just so you could introduce yourselves and kind of tell me what brought you here today, what a little bit about your background, professionally, personally, and stuff like that, and uh, and where you are today, and maybe give us a, a share with us a little bit of your thoughts and feelings about AI art as it stands today at this particular point in time. So I guess we can start with Hardy. I'm just looking in order there. So go for it. Yeah, uh, definitely. Hey, Hardy Fowler. Um, I am a concept artist and illustrator with about 14 years of industry experience. Uh, Disney Imagineering is probably my headlining resume item. Also a teacher and a mentor. I think everybody here is, which is awesome. Uh, Avengers Assembled. Um, <laughs> Yeah, but yeah, I, I think I've gone the whole arc of this, like, and I am, it, it was about a year ago when this first became like headline news, kind of mainstream news. And I've gone the whole arc from, you know, existential terror to sort of, yeah. it mm -hmm. sort of seemed to like go away a little bit. Some of the noise died down and I was wondering if maybe the wave was cresting a little bit. It's been this crazy roller coaster. Um, something that I felt ill-equipped for, and frankly, is a bunch of artists. I don't think it was reasonable for us to be able to answer these insane existential humanity questions. Mm -hmm. And somehow yeah. we were the first group sort of thrown into all of this. Mm -hmm. Very strange, ironically, because everybody always said art would be the last thing to be replaced by machines. And was yeah. the first in like a way. Last week they said that. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so I guess I am in a much better place with this lately, just because the more time that passes without the apocalypse happening, the more it starts feeling kind of stabilized. Maybe these things are sort of being worked into workflows in a way that does not completely cut out artists. So it's mostly just been a like watching and waiting making sure that all of the indicators of like our industry's health are still good. So far, like the phone is still ringing, so to speak, just mm -hmm. personally. And artists I work with are still getting jobs. So like careers are beginning, which was the thing that I think everybody here is most worried about is just if those early incubator like first gigs all get swallowed up then you know what or does that leave our industry in the future so um that has been kind of the uh in a nutshell version of my whole arc with this to this day that's sort of what i'm watching currently but um total uh totally mind-boggling all of this so yeah. very curious to hear what what everybody 
where everybody is currently. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you. And uh, yeah, I mirror a lot of that. I'm kind of in the I'm in the observation phase of things and I'm not jumping to any conclusions mm -hmm. as things roll out. Um, but yeah, no, I've, I've definitely given a lot of thought as well. And Kelsey, how about you? What, what are your thoughts? Well, I yeah, know about sure. a lot of your thoughts because I watch your videos, all of your videos. But uh, yeah, share what, where your head is so far. Yeah, I'm Kelsey. I'm fresh out of college compared to most people here. I'm two years since I graduated school. I'm an oil painter and art YouTuber and my partner actually works in AI safety and like regulation. Like his whole mission really? is like to put it in layman's terms, trying to avoid the plot of the Terminator movie. So um, okay. that's like his whole focus. And all of his coworkers very firmly believe that AI is not just a risk to like the art industry, but to the continued survival of our species. So it's like a much bigger problem yeah. for the people in my life, at least. Um, personally, I think that like, people that are currently working on safety and regulation for AI are very smart, talented, like well-rounded people that want mm -hmm. the best for us. And they're doing all that they can. And there's like headway being made in that direction. Um, and also I think that like, regardless of my continued ability to make money from my art, I will still continue making it. Um, it's just like a thing that I love mm -hmm. doing. And I mm -hmm. think that a lot of other artists feel the same way, but also I think that AI, can be used eventually as a tool for artists to help us really express our creativity and just get more stuff done, which is a really appealing prospect. Mm -hmm. And once we figure out and resolve the copyright issues, the ethical like the ethical problems when it comes to the training of these models, hopefully we can use this as an amazing tool for us and it won't actually be as existential of a risk. Mm -hmm. um, and that's my hope at least. I, I try to be more of an optimist. I'm curious to Kelsey, because uh, I know that you have a background in political science as well. Yeah, how's yeah. that? How's that influencing your thought process on all this? Because you have an interesting perspective on that. For sure. I mean, I think if you look at history, like a lot of the art movements evolve in response to stuff going on in the broader world, right? Mm -hmm. Like the arts and crafts movement was evolved in response to the Industrial Revolution. I think that if AI gets to a point where it is taking a lot of artists jobs, art movements will evolve in response to that. And there might be a revival of like, just like a human appreciation for our individual labor yeah. um, and the time that it takes us to do things. And hopefully that will be appreciated more than it is currently. Mm. Yeah, no, thank you for that. Thank you. Um, and Tyler, how about you? Hi. Yeah. I've been, I've been in the field for a while. I, I kind of accidentally became a teacher and mm -hmm. mentor through <laughs> YouTube. And I think like a lot of, a lot of you guys, and again, it's pleasure being here with all of you, first of all. Um, but I, I never sought out to do that. It just kind of accidentally evolved over time. And my interest in art and just creating existed long before I ever saw any kind of monetary gain for it too. So mm -hmm. regardless of what happens with the AI, I'm gonna be creating you know, probably till I physically can't create anymore. And who knows, maybe with the AI in the future, um, even when we're beyond physically being able to put a pen to the tablet and, and paper anymore, maybe we'll still be able to do that, which kind of leads me to my next thought is like, I, uh, you know, as a, as a creator on this whole wave of it, I think I've definitely been on the more positive or optimistic side of it. Mm -hmm. I don't like taking a trip to negative town for anything. <laughs> I haven't spoken out a lot publicly. I made like one video like eight months ago when it first popped up, I tried it. I tried it in a professional workflow, had fun with it. It was like a new shiny toy, put it down. Cause again, it solves too many problems for me. And I mm -hmm. like the process way too much mm -hmm. to want to have a tool like AI create all the pictures for me. I like to get, you know, in the trenches through thick and thin and, and create and then really embrace that process. So. It's cool. I like it. I can definitely see how it, it can be utilized in, in a in a professional setting. I'm working for, for you know games like Epic Epic right now, I'm working on Fortnite. They put out a pretty hard stance, at least at this point. They okay. don't want it involved at all. They do not want to be uh, kind of brought down by any more legal lawsuits than they already do. Like They kind of got their hands full with, with enough yeah, of those. Yeah. So they don't want it. And if you do use it, they want you to be forward enough to like let the legal department know and we have to let the legal department know on a day-to-day -day basis with a, right. with a number of things anyway it, you know mm -hmm. any kind of object or 
prop that we design that has any kind of real world correlation, whether it's mm -hmm. like a gas canister or a light fixture, yep. they want to see our references on that to make sure it's different enough from a real world counterpart so that nobody's getting sued. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I know bigger companies are, <laughs> are taking stances differently on this. Like I've seen a headline, haven't read a single article with Blizzard, that Blizzard is going to be embracing it, you know, to fill out their worlds. I'm doing okay. um, a, um, I have a contract with them now just doing illustration work. It doesn't seem to be any part of, of that kind of sector for it, but it seems like some big companies are using it. Some are definitely staying away. I got some friends at Naughty Dog. They're basically just using AI right now as a reference tool. And I, mm -hmm. I'm like, I think I'm, that's totally awesome because that's, a, you know, as artists and creators, we can spend a lot of time referencing. And if we can build a reference or a mood board, which is just kind of give us a little bit of a feeling and emotion, right, on, on a particular mm -hmm. idea. Mm -hmm. if, it, if it can help, you know, us create in, in some kind of secondhand way, I think that's fantastic. So... I know it is being used as, as a tool in, in some regards, but again, I think with a big company like that, they're, the AI art itself is not going to be in any kind of final image, and it's not going to yeah. directly be a part of anything that's final, but right, it, it gets conversation started, it gets meetings, you know, pushed forward in, in regards to what's being solved. So yeah, it, it's, it's, I don't know, it's crazy, right? We're all in this, we're on this AI soup, and uh, again, mm -hmm. I'm trying to just see the positive side of it. Yeah, I think um of course sub jobs are going to be compromised for it i think maybe if anything some areas of the competition is going to be a little tighter but i've also seen areas where um uh, there's new jobs being created with it I mean, i'm not going to take any more time today maybe we'll get back into that but yeah i, I kind of do a little bit of everything and i'm mm -hmm. optimistic about it i like that you're taking you're actually giving us a, a, how it's being used in studios and stuff like that and and how studios are definitely taking the safe route not trying to implicate themselves legally in case something comes yep. up. Where did that material come from? So very interesting. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm, I might mute and unmute because, of course, you know, whenever you record, whenever you record a call, there's a garbage truck outside, like usual. Um, <laughs> but, uh, Istabrak, how about you? Yes. <clears throat> Hello, I'm Istabrak. Um, I've been teaching for about 10 years and um, I really don't know exactly what it is that, that I'm bringing to the art world, but I know it through what people, my students tell me I'm bringing in, which is um, just explanation of things that were pretty complex to them, difficult to understand, abstract fundamentals, creative process, how the creative process merges with the technical process. That's the kind of stuff that I feel like I'm good at explaining and that's what they tell me I brought to the table. So um, that's really what I am. I try to make things that are complex, easier to understand. I, I talk most of the time to directly to the quote unquote noob. I try to be as accessible to them as possible. I try to make the beginner experience not as scary and daunting because most of the time I'm talking to like my younger self when I was just getting into art, utterly confused about what the heck fundamentals were and what it was all about and how to get better and the limited resources of like the 90s versus now and trying to just provide as much of that dialogue as possible. So that's what I do. I do critiques on YouTube. I, I just critique most of the stuff that I critique is like beginner to intermediate. And I try to show how the step to a more advanced painting is actually a very short step. It's not something very complex fundamentals when they're understood like deeply understood can evolve a painting mm. immediately in 30 minutes in an hour you can change your entire illustration if you just understand the cube or understand the edge or understand what a brush is and when to use it and what its purpose is a specific kind of brush etc so um as for ai so because i'm always interacting with uh what i would call like the beginner intermediate um what i've noticed the most its impact is their self-esteem mm. um student self-esteem is at an all-time low it's never been lower i think in my opinion because mm. they're asking questions like why should i even bother getting into it i've also discovered student my personal students um asking me if they can use ai in their homework which is an absolute no <laughs> mm. um and i've also uh, uh just you know just looked at um its impact on the dialogue people are talking more about ai than talking about their own art um in like my discord or on the communities they just are really mesmerized by it instead of wait spending that time 
um, believing that they can do what uh, what AI can do, or just you know uh, challenging themselves to try something that AI is already doing, um, they're just kind of really entertained by. It. And I'm hoping it is just like a fad, or it's just something that it will eventually fade into a tool. When it first came out, I wasn't threatened by it. I was amazed by it. I was like, holy god, they made code, and they just made now they have illustrations. Like, how did they do that? I was just deeply amazed by the programming behind it but then all of a sudden this ethical stuff came up and i was like wow the audacity to try to monetize what is a culminative kind of uh uh, uh, uh like the collective uh our collective genius how they how they just took all of our work and then made art out of it and to monetize it that's when i started backing away a little bit that's when i was like okay there's ethical issues here I shouldn't be, because I have students that I'm influencing, I shouldn't be too amazed by it. I shouldn't be entertaining it too much. As for its future use, I think it's extremely useful. I think the point you made in the initial questions you asked us, Adam, was about like, you know, photography, which might, which we, uh, might touch into later. But um, at the moment, I really, I just feel like at where it is right now, it's starting to evolve into a, a tool that we can call when we need, like to fill in the blanks when we just don't want to spend 15 hours on textures, when we don't want to spend that much time or waste time we could be spending drafting or or just, just being ourselves or living our lives, which is what AI is all about, freeing our time. Mm -hmm. So if it's freeing our time from the like, you know, the more difficult part about being an artist, which is the time invested into each piece, time that can be done by something else, then it'll free us to be more creative, it'll give us more creative opportunity. So there's the student and teacher side of things. And then there's the the actual usefulness, the, the usefulness that it can provide us, the, the, the time it could save us. So I think I'm at a, like a middle ground. Um, mostly my issue with the ethical aspect is just my issue with like all of that excessive capitalism, consumerism kind of stuff yeah. where they're trying to monetize everything and everything is just getting, you know, to be a little more tasteless. But um, I am open to it. I am open to all of the innovation that's behind it. I'm open to the amazing things that it might do for for artists. And, and we might get into all those details later, but uh, that's where I am with it. I'm just worried about the student, their self-esteem um, and their personal identity and how it may be affecting them at the moment. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, which is which is it's interesting. You're saying the same thing is uh, mentioning the same thing that Tyler said with regard to his work is that the process, the process is extremely important. Mm -hmm. and that's kind of the proof of the humanity behind it. Um, thank you. Mm -hmm. That was that was fantastic. Yeah. And uh, Antonio, how about you? Hey, uh, um, yeah, I think I find myself in a very similar position to Tyler. Actually, I, um, mm -hmm. we both run a small studio for bigger major clients. So we're working professional slash art directors and we both have an online learning platform. Hmm. So we can sort of see both ends of the spectrum, I would say, when it comes to what's happening in the professional field, what's happening with our students, what's the mindset, what's the overall feeling about this thing. So it, it's, it's, it's both interesting, sometimes terrifying to see what it does to our community and how it lives in our community. Um, I've, you know, I've heard S Steven talk about it a lot. Um, I'm still on the fence for me. I'm, I'm still volatile when it comes to my opinion about it. It's hard mm -hmm. to pinpoint right now what I do, what I, there's definitely aspects of it. I don't like there's things that I hate about it at this point. I'm a little bit over the ethical part. I'm sorry to say it's but just because of where it's hitting critical mass and how we're treated more like data points than than anything else. So it's mm -hmm. that's not my major concern. My major concern is in in uh, in line with what Istabrak was saying, actually, mm -hmm. more about student motivation um, mm -hmm. and you know new aspiring artists getting demotivated to actually pursue their passion. Which is, I take that much more to heart as a teacher mm -hmm. than than all of the other stuff of or like being precious about my copyright. It's more about you know how can we keep students and keep art actually motivated and in line with that what i don't really like is what ai art has facilitated is the oversaturation of art especially digital art oh, yeah. which is something i really don't like it's the we're at, at this point we're exploding and diluting art so much just because of the masses amounts of art that's being generated you're that's kind true. of losing that special feeling for like when i see splash art now i i don't even care anymore because <laughs> it's just wow. it's so it's so generated 
that that it doesn't feel you don't get that sense of like wonder anymore a lot of the times and that's part or uh, highly because of AI art. Um, what I do want to say in defense of artists, um, and then I'll wrap it up, is Stephen at some point said that the screwdriver is a tool. the The robot arm was a replacement uh, in in like in in regards to art. And I do want to say that we should consider ourselves more as the car designer and not the factory worker. Mm -hmm. So it's more about we mm -hmm. make the decisions, we design the things, we're like the creative directors, uh, we're not the people working in the mill um, and like trying to assemble things. So that's where I have a little bit of a different expect, like, like a different vision on what mm -hmm. AI has in terms of impact. Yeah. But uh, that's where I'll leave it. Okay, it's funny you're saying that too, okay. because I was just watching, uh, just yesterday, I was watching Steven's uh, uh, interview on Art Cafe, when you were talking on Art Cafe. And you mentioned something similar, Stephen. You were saying that uh, you know when you go on ArtStation or something like that, you're kind of getting annoyed with trying to figure out whether or not something is AI generated or not, right? And yeah. uh, it was very interesting. And and as well, if you're sitting on an app, if you're on Discord, if you're playing with Midjourney or anything like that, you're looking at this this waterfall of imagery being generated all the time, and you become very numb to that whole process. That said, I think that a lot of social media platforms can have a very similar effect. Just in, just in terms of the integrity of the individual artist and student, especially younger artists who are sitting there looking at this splash page of, of masterpieces mm -hmm. from God knows who. And that can also overwhelm the senses as well. It's quality versus mm -hmm. quantity, right? But no, thank you, Antonio. That's fantastic. And Stephen, how about you? Hi, I'm Stephen Zapata. Um, I've been a professional designer and illustrator for over a decade now. Um, like many people on this call, you know, been working for clients, have worked at studios, uh, I've designed for video games, movies, I've done theme parks all over the world. Wow. Um, and I also have an online learning platform like many of us here where we all engage with students a lot so we can kind of keep a pulse on what people who are trying to come into the industry are doing. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm probably relevant here because in October of last year, I released a video called uh, The End of Art, an argument against image AIs that sort yeah. of went around our community and outside of it a bit, um, where I sort of put forth my, like I said, arguments against image AIs. Um, uh, now, everybody has already said a lot here, and I did owe a lot of what everybody has said in their introductions, but um, to sort of state my position, I'm going to guess I'm probably the most cynical and pessimistic person <laughs> on this call when it comes to AI, well, which I want to quantify Steve, I'd that. I'd also see the most educated on the subject as well. I mean, I was listening to your talks. Well, probably. You know, you've, you've done you've done your homework well before this became trend. So, you know, your, mm. your opinion is very valuable here for sure. Yeah. Th thank you. Well, so yeah. Um, well, first, let me quantify with I'm I'm cynical and pessimistic about the AI stuff, but that's not who I am generally. Like a lot of people on this call, uh, and I think artists artists who have made it, quote unquote, are sort of a self-selecting set for this. Mm -hmm. I'm driven by positivity and I seek balance and I'm always looking for a silver lining. And I'm Absolutely. very interested in controlling like my emotionality and my internality. I think that all of us who have come far in art have had to do that a bit because otherwise you it's very hard to pull it off. So I am generally like in the middle of my deep pessimism and cynicism, I'm having some of the best days of my life. Like I don't, mm. this stuff isn't unhorsing me while I'm hanging out with my friends or while I'm out in nature. I feel deeply happy and peaceful uh, most of the time, usually when I'm not talking about AI. It's mm. on this topic, I have found what I feel to be good reason to be uh, I don't know how to put it lightly, just extremely worried. Wow. Now mm. that that might be that might be the product of the fact that I've been thinking about it for a very long time. I actually just yesterday, I found a video of mine on my YouTube from October of 2019. So going on four years now, where I mention AIs and the possibility that they could replace a lot of the iterative work in commercial design. And I say it in that video as if anybody was talking to me about that stuff and taking it seriously. Mm. No, I was the only person having that conversation <laughs> with myself at that point when I had showed it to peers and stuff like that. They were like, huh, 
Stephen, you read too many sci-fi novels, right? So <laughs> I have had this stuff on my mind for a long time, and I have taken it seriously for a long time. Um, yeah, I think my view will sort of come out as we move on towards uh, other questions. But in general, uh, like everyone has said, ethical and copyright concerns are certainly very important to me. Uh, mm -hmm. I acknowledge that they are probably the most complicated version of them that we have ever encountered in our lifetimes. They're yeah. unbelievably complex situations. Um, I I love students and I I... <laughs> I hate seeing what this is doing to them and the way yeah. that it's affecting their hearts and their minds. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it it wasn't easy for me to post a 50, me a 50 minute worried screed on my YouTube, mm -hmm. knowing the effect that it would have on my students, on my friends, on my peers and the environment at large. If you listen to all of my other YouTube videos, they're literally me saying like, pay attention to your mind while you draw and pain and suffering will dissolve. Like I have a very <laughs> mushy, like bohemian view of art. It was not comfortable for me to post that, but I take the situation extremely seriously, extremely seriously. Well, you're taking, you're take, you're, you're in a sense playing the devil's advocate, um, um, stepping away from your usual safe place as an artist and that, and that, that energy that you're sharing with your audience which I do too. That's something that, that we all take. We all take uh, um, pride in doing that as well. To look at the pic, look at the look at things objectively and say this is what's actually happening. And you you mentioned as well. It's kind of segue into into the next thing I wanted to mention as well directly with you, uh, Steve, which was what part of our art? What's the part of our art that is being stolen from us? Right. If you're on, if you're watching a bunch of people who've never drawn anything before in their life, they've never trained themselves in artistic fundamentals. And we're watching them. I'm, I'm on mid journey and I'm watching a bunch of people prompt different images painted or photographic or whatever, because this impacts all kinds of imagery, not just illustrations, but you're watching people pump this out. You're thinking to yourself, what is it about that that would be hurtful or bothersome or worrisome to a trained artist like myself, as I'm watching other people mm -hmm. turn this stuff out, what are they taking? What are they taking for granted? And that is the process. Hello, Gimli. That is my cat just rubbed on my leg. Um, that is the artistic <laughs> process, the fundamentals. It's the sacrifice of time and energy. We as people, at least in, in society as we've known for a very long time, has been has been valued. Our skill in general, not just artists, but our skill in general is is based off of our ability to do something that somebody else can't or isn't willing to do. It's our craft. It's the time. Mm -hmm. It's the energy that we put into it. And all of a sudden, that's taken away from us, right? Arguably, this is exactly what oh, my cat wants to play. No, sweetie, no, no. Uh, that's what um, that's what programmers are complaining about too. That they programmed AI to get to a certain point, and all of a sudden they can't anymore. Sweetie, no. After <laughs> he thinks it's playtime as well. She um, wants to give us her opinion as well. He does, she and he's pissed. Defend. He's very pissed. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's that AI has gotten to a certain point right now where it's where it's even for programmers they can't program it anymore. That that programming is being taken out of the people who programmed in the first place, who created this in the first place, mm -hmm. and there's kind wow. of this loss of time and effort. Wherein lies our value? And I was watching a video. Um, I was watching a video recently. It was a diary of a CEO with, I can't remember who it was specifically, but he was the guy, oh, it was the Tom Cruise guy, the Tom Cruise lookalike guy who does all of those TikToks. Uh, he does the, uh, oh. the, the uh, whatchamacallit, where you face the face replacement thing? Deep fake? Deep fake. He's a deep fake Tom deep Cruise, fake, yeah. deep Tom or something like that. And he was talking yeah. about yeah. how, um, he was talking about how, uh, um, our contribution to society, what gives us value is that service that we're providing to people. And all of a sudden that service is no longer required of us because AI can do that automatically. So we have, in a sense, it's kind of it mirrors what a lot of you, a lot of you guys were saying as well is where do we find value moving forward? If that, that value that we, we, or at least that, that, that label of professional that we give ourselves because we're being hired and paid for that service is no longer a payable service, right? Mm -hmm. So if I bring that back to you, Steve, what do you think about that? What is it about an artist that you feel uh, gives them value? And what is what is ultimately being robbed of the 
craftsperson. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I might be a difficult person to ask about this, um, just cause, um, I hold pretty extreme views on this, I think, mm -hmm. um, compared to most people. So, so <laughs> I think that, I think that, okay. On an ultimate level, um, I think it's, foolish to base your self-worth on anything about being an artist. I'm really un uninterested in the labels around it. I think that it's a very slippery slope where, you know, your happiness and contentedness with yourself is based on your successes and the last good job that you got and the last pat on the back that you got. And I just think that all of those things are basically poison for the heart of the artist in the long run. And mm -hmm. it's very difficult to ignore those things when they're happening, you know, when you're getting the emails and you're feeling very big and fluffed up, but then the, the consequences are delivered right on schedule the second that those emails stop coming in. Mm -hmm. So I have always advised students to, if you're struggling with that, that's not an artist problem. That's a person problem. Like you need mm -hmm. to do the self-investigation to find out that you have self-worth and are worth being alive and are being an important and are an important person just off the fact that you live and breathe and you're here. Mm -hmm. Like it's, you, you know, it's like I said, I have a very mushy bohemian view of art deep down at its core because of that. And because I do try to ground my feelings in those ultimate intuitions, my views then on the AI stuff are almost laughably practical by comparison. It's like you're scraping our hard work. It's that simple. Like I, I understand that there's a lot of ambiguous and vague integrity and heart that can be sort of attached like a mystical floating bird to our pictures, mm -hmm. but there, there's very little to be said about that. That is concrete or actionable. I personally believe and the concrete and actionable part that I'm interested in is, is it okay? Four companies, any company, any startup, just two guys. It doesn't have to be, forget the magic of, wow, mid journey, wow, stable diffusion, wow, they're in the news, they're real, they're a thing. The laws, the regulations, everything right now says, if I right now decide I'm a startup, I can just take everybody's goddamn work mm -hmm. and do whatever the hell I want with it. And that's not, that that to me is the crux of the problem interpretations that you know all of these other things around art are are being taken uh, yes i do believe those are involved yes i as a very mushy person about art i do think that it's wrong to take people's heart to take their grander identity to incorporate mm -hmm their intuitions and their base feelings which they have imbued into their art and take it in a pixel form uh through the pictures but well, that stuff is very fuzzy. I'm not interested in the fuzzy stuff for this particular topic. I want to go to court with it. I want to mm -hmm. go to Washington mm -hmm. with it. And I take that stuff very seriously. And no representative is going to listen to me talk about the magical heart of a picture that is floating mm -hmm. above it or something like that. I wish they did. I wish we lived in that world because well, I do think that stuff yes. is true. But <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. So, so I, I'm more I'm more interested in, in the usage, just the appropriation of everybody's work and creativity for forget why they say they're doing it. What matters is that they're just allowed. Mm -hmm. That's it. Yeah, that's, somebody that's should have regulated it from it. ever having been researched or even looked into. This should, a whistleblower should have said, look at what's being developed right now. Your art is being taken collectively and being used to develop this really threatening AI system. And we all need to be talking about it. It was like under the radar and all of a sudden we had Majorney. It came out of nowhere. Yeah. Like what happened while it was being developed? Why was it so secretly developed? And why was nobody in on it being developed? That's my question as well, which I completely agree with Stephen. Um, Congress, all those people in, in, in Washington, they don't speak in any other language other than money and capitalism. So if we go there with that kind of mindset, this was developed without our permission. It was developed like theft. It was just a big um, uh, heist to steal things that were not allowed to them and we're not we're not even like it wasn't even brought us brought to us or pitched to us it was just it came out of nowhere and that's what's really scary and Stephen, wouldn't you are you still concerned are you still concerned on a micro level because i'm more concerned on a macro level that mm -hmm. since the inception of the internet we've actually been part unwillingly been part of the most 
crazy data collecting experiment in the mm -hmm. history of mankind where every yeah. data, not just our artwork, but every piece of data is now being collected as and being used and scraped as usable input for AI, mm -hmm. not just our art. Like yeah. on a, I'm, I'm more concerned on a macro level than I am on a micro level. Like what, what is this doing to us? Because when it comes to art, it's, it's like you said, it's still malicious people mm -hmm. doing malicious stuff with the technology for me it's more at some point when will the technology itself become dangerous with all of the macro data that it's being fed mm -hmm. yeah i i agree completely just just to answer your question antonio yeah i am more concerned on the macro level i've said this in many other talks but on the micro level I have very little concern over an individual using any product. I really have very little concern for the end users. You know, that's why I'm not someone who's arguing with end users online. You know, when mm. I see an AI piece of art, I don't comment on it, even though I'm uh, very involved in advocacy against it. Um, uh, yeah, I'm absolutely more concerned with the systemic problems and art happens to be my lane that I'm in, but with, with everything that I know and everything that I've seen, it's like, it's just the lane. Like the real problem is the sort of larger macroeconomic yeah. and societal problem. Yeah. Yeah. No, it d definitely impacts all of us. It impacts all of us. Right. And I've even, I got, I, I allowed my brain to go off on some, some uh, sci-fi tangent last night as I was sitting, watching a bunch of different videos. And I was thinking to myself, um, I was reflecting back on stories I'd heard from my mother growing up where we had the computer scientists, this is back in the 1970s, like 60s and 70s, they had all the computer scientists at one end of the room, uh, hallway, and all the fine artists at the other end of the hallway. And all the computer scientists were looking at the at the artists and going, ugh, did they ever take baths, all right? And all the computer scientists are at the other, uh, uh, and all the kids <laughs> at the other side going, this guy's the worst geek I've ever seen in my life. There's kind of like this oil and water thing. And then all of a sudden, mm. you got computer graphics. And the world of science and art kind of intermeshed. And up until this point, up until this point, even though we we've been we've been mixing DNA a little bit with computer graphics and all these different things, where science and art have been working together in partnership, we've been exclusive to our own tribes to a certain degree. This is an art community. This is a programmer community. But what's happening now is, since both artists and programmers in this context that we are right now are kind of, um, well, we're kind of becoming one process that neither one of us really have any control over. This is the real merging of human abilities, which can be phenomenal and incredible. Maybe this is what society has been striving for since the dawn of time to kind of find this intermingling of skill. But at the at the same time, how is this going to transform society? I know I'm totally going off on a, on a sci-fi tangent here, but um, uh, this plays into it, right? Where we've been exclude, our skills have been exclusive from one another, but they're no longer exclusive. Now we're all part of a collective consciousness moving forward. Okay. Now I, I completely took the conversation off the rails there, but uh, yeah, Tyler, how about you? What's your what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, it, it it's crazy because like like a lot of these issues have plagued us and troubled us you know before ai like you know art is going to get stolen it was getting stolen before ai and like it, it, on an individual basis it, i don't think it's you know as a big of a deal i think once we put our ourselves out there right and we're putting our our work online we're, we're always kind of taking that risk like when we produce content we produce a lot of us put produce educational content like i'm not going to not produce that because i know it's going to like instantly get pirated because because it always does it and, and that just kind of goes with it it it, what I really hate seeing amongst a lot of this is is how we're treating each other like as creatives and like the hostility oh, yeah. behind it is insane. Like right with with your video, Adam, like two weeks ago, it doesn't take much to get a mob going and like artists to start turning on each other like left and right. And it's like we're all kind of in that that same boat. And if again, a lot of people are just more in the mindset of just like, let's help each other instead of just like throwing each other you know, to the wall is it you know it's so it's like again it's a people thing where it's like yeah at, at the at the higher level it's going to be these corporations that's why i really hate or not hate but like that's my biggest issue with the ai is like 
you know, it's being monetized. None of us, of course, are being are compensated or any of that. And it's always like these corporations at the top that are doing it for their gain. That's kind of like another little subtopic in itself. But at the end of the day, it's a lot of us, you know, the people that are just with that, that bad intent toward one another. Like, oh, I'm going to just rip a bunch of people's art. I'm going to make a calendar. I'm going to start selling the calendar. And I, I'm, I'm all for 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 the individual, for the creator and finding a way to you know, make a business and stuff, but right, like there's, it's that huge moral area where it's like, well, you don't really own the rights to any of this and that, and that's an issue. So yeah, I don't know. I might be just at this point talking in a circle, but yeah, it, it's, I think it's the intent, you know, with the creator and now having access to this technology that would just leave a particular type of person to go down, you know, a particular path where like, if, if this is the type of person that's going to steal art or pirate art or try to find a back doorway of kind of creating a buck off of someone else's success, they're probably going to do it anyway. So it, yeah, I don't know. It's like, why aren't people kind? <laughs> you know? well, if you think of what you're playing yeah, on, Tyler, it kind of taps into what, what a lot of us are all mirroring the same thing. And if you think about it, you're in the context of what you just said, it, think about where you work right now. You're working for studios as an artist. If you go back to the 70s and 80s or anything before that, this whole concept of studio artwork where you have a bunch of artists that pack into an office, they call it a studio, but it's an office, right? You pack it into a studio where everybody's responsible for their part of this conveyor belt, this kind of process of, of artistry. Some people are concept artists, some people are doing these assets, et cetera, et cetera. Everybody's responsible for the little thing. That's industrializing the artistic process, which is something that prior to that, was not the case where we more often than not would have we'd have independent illustrators we would have fine artists that would open up their own galleries art was a personal endeavor and business the corporate world and art never intermingled why do you think that why do you think mm -hmm. it's been so hard over the years for art itself to be monetized the number one question artists will always ask you is how much do i charge for my art that's one of the most elusive mm -hmm. questions out there it still is so the corporate world took care of that this is your salary you're going to be making per hour for churning out your skill. Now, this is what, what you're describing here and what, what we're alluding to here is I've noticed that everybody's face changes in this entire group the moment money becomes an issue. When it's philosophical, when it's personal, when it's emotional, when you're taking care of your students and you're taking care of the well-being of everybody's thoughts and feelings, everybody kind of has the general kind of relaxed attitude about it. But as soon as money comes in and business people say, oh, now we can churn all of this crap, all this data that we've collected and we can make money off of it. And this is when Steve came in at, at the end of his video on AI that, that, that when he posted months ago, where he said, this is where the artist has to advocate. This is where we have to come in as artists and say, no, 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 that's not open data. This isn't the wild west. You can't just come in and grab us all and, and, and exsanguinate us mm -hmm. and, and monetize that. This is my property. And if you're using my my art as a data set, I should be compensated for that process, which I thought was a very smart way of, of getting artists involved in that process. I can volunteer my art to train an AI model, right? But then I'm controlling the financial side of these things. And what you're saying that too with Tyler, it's the same thing. It's, it's, it's always been that point of contention that artists and, and people are out for a buck don't mix very well. Right. Especially when artists want yeah. to take ownership of their own stuff. Yeah. Very cool. It's like literally a, a farmer from down the road coming up to set up shop on my property, right? Like on my front lawn selling their product and I don't get a cut. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It really is, isn't it? It comes down to that. And uh, Kelsey, didn't how about AI you? AI hit the, hit the, oh. oh, so sorry. Go ahead. No, no, please. It's right. Go, go ahead. ahead. Oh, didn't AI hit the music industry first? And then they yeah. just completely blew it out. They destroyed it. Any chance it had and go because music industry was it's backed. It's got it's an industry where you can't yeah. say that art is an industry. It's so localized to each studio and it's not really it's not a collective uh, army. So I feel like if we thought about ourselves with that same worth, I mean you can't look in any direction without seeing art, even the way our mice are, 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 are like designed on our computer or our monitors, the way the keyboard is symmetrically set up, the way, mm. you know, everything around me right now, an artist was involved in its development. So why can't we think like that? Why can't we think of ourselves as a valuable? 
because I think that we've our, our self-esteem was hijacked a long time ago exactly what you said which is when it was industrialized mm-hmm. and they gave us a specific they told us basically I mean people are still struggling putting value on their art like you said and mm-hmm. people are still being told just give it to me for free you're getting experience blah 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 all of that <laughs> uh stigma Thank against you. artists just asking for money like it's it's unbelievable like we need to start thinking of ourselves as indispensable to society we are not replaceable this is not something that can be replaced because we have always provided this this film of uh completion to everything around us um and one thing i like to say is there's this episode in fairly odd parents which is like they never that nothing ever really created such a, a perfect metaphor for it they basically said something about he made a wish about getting rid of all color or something like that in the world. And so everybody was just a gray blob. So I bring that up to show my students. I'm like, the uh, the world would be something very similar to this without artists, without that film of completion that we add over everything, our tastes, our colors, our thinness in our lines, thickness in our lines, the floral patterns, the, the, the rigid patterns, Art Deco, Art Nouveau, whatever it was, it defines ages, it defines millennia, it defines our, our you know, the Egyptian empire, this, that. So we have value, we are valuable, we are not without esteem. So us uh, seeing ourselves it's, it's a really a revolution of the mind just like steven says we have to stop seeing ourselves as replaceable because i think there is a lot of that shaken self-esteem in the art world and it starts at that first step it starts with the beginner hmm. well said thank you but yeah sorry kelsey go ahead yeah, no, no, no. oh yeah, yeah i mean i think awesome. a lot of these questions will be decided in the court system mm-hmm. um there are currently like multiple class action lawsuits when it comes to The data scraping issues that Stephen was talking about, right, with Leon 5B, the kind of training model that's being used to create all of these AI art models, um, and how like they basically stole these this research team um, under fair use, which is like kind of a complex like legal thing right there in in and of it by itself. But um, this research team and creation of Leon 5B, this training model, scraped I mean millions of images from the internet, from Instagram, from DeviantArt. And really, like, there are a lot of really complex legal questions, whether that's allowed. Um, and personally, I think that it's very likely that this case will be decided in favor of the artists, but I'm also simultaneous, simultaneously a little pessimistic about it. Um, I think that I don't have a lot of trust in, like, the legal system or in government, and I think that um, at the end of the day, this will come down to our collective action and whether or not artists can really put pressure on major corporations to implement laws that do us justice mm-hmm. yeah when money gets involved yeah when money gets involved all yeah. of a sudden a lot of excuses start getting made to support mm-hmm. whatever it is that's going on yeah well said and hardy how about you what do you guys think about the um if i could jump in the uh yeah. copyright policy i saw mark Bernays video recently that just seemed like this mm-hmm. hallelujah we're saved mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. You can't copyright AI art, apparently, unless an artist changes it so substantially that it constitutes something new and original that a Mm -hmm. human authored. Um, Yeah. I got a feeling there's gray area there and some nuance. Like, it it probably isn't this all clear, everything's fine, that that sort of made it sound like. But that does seem like a positive. I'll admit I'm like actively seeking out news to feel good about this. And I think a lot of people are. And that mm-hmm. certainly was that. But um, I'm curious, like, does that mean, so for example, Art Station, and I'm probably opening up a whole other can of worms there, but you'll see there are people selling like AI reference packs, just mm-hmm. a thousand images of Space Girl, all mm-hmm. generated by AI. And I'm kind of wondering, like, how is that even legal? Wow. And yeah. Yeah, that's you just it. take that guy's yeah. images and sell them somewhere else because he couldn't copyright that. It's also ethically tangled and weird. And just from its inception, the way all of this data was scraped, so just rotten at its core. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, it's a thread you start pulling and it just leads you to you know, where is all, all of this going for artists and for just people at large? If if the thing that, that makes you valuable, your skilled labor, and I'll admit like, so 
in the earlier days, there was all this, well, surely AI can never X or mm -hmm. yeah, it can make something look real, but it will never look expressive and artful. Well, now it kind of does that. So it's like they're key. I've learned to stop saying surely AI will never whatever. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, but I don't even really want to surrender that. Like, I like this cool thing I know how to do, you know, even if it's my soul and decision making, my design sense, if that's still, you know, locked away and AI can't do that stuff yet, still kind of sucks that, uh, damn, that is a really nice looking portrait that this click just created. Mm -hmm. You know, that is no less of a loss just if there is higher things that still isn't gone. So um, kind of rambling there, but uh, what do you guys think about that that copyright policy? I don't think it's even like a law. It's just sort of a sentence lifted yeah. from something gesture, that sounds point, yeah. like some protection, mm -hmm. but curious what you guys who might know more about that than I do I think, think about that. put his hand up for to answer. Yeah. So. Awesome. If I can jump in on that. Um, so what you're referencing is most likely the copyright office. Uh, and again, we should state here, it's it's the United States Copyright <laughs> Office. One of the things yeah. that makes this so complicated is that, you know, we've got, there's not a lot of news and a lot of decisions on all this stuff. So yeah, we're talking about US laws here, but they're not laws, but um, the, it, everything's gonna be different in the EU, in Canada and South mm -hmm. America. Now there's places that are going to sort of set the tone, you know, generally EU law, especially is very influential. Um, but it, uh, it, we're not talking about everywhere, but I think what you're referencing is the U.S. copyright offices issued guidance on copyrights for gen AI generated materials. Now the U S copyright office does not make laws, but they do provide guidance when it's appropriate to the legislature when they are going to try to pass a law. I don't know what that's like in another place like Canada. I don't know if that situation changes in a Canadian copyright office. But in the U.S., they're basically providing guidance and the stance that they took mostly by weighing the work of one Chris Castanova, who is making a comic, uh, I believe it's Zarya of the Dawn, I believe it is, with Midjourney. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're using this as a sort of test case. Um, and so far, um, what they arrived at is that the parts of the comic that were generated by Midjourney in this case, do not qualify for copyright because copyright is for uh, human agency. And they determined through a complex series of logic and rationing that you can read in their issued letter that those images that were generated did not reach the level of being controlled by human agency. They said that the system was not predictable enough for uh, Chris to have known that what she was producing was going to come out the way that she intended. But they did say that the whole comic itself was copyrightable. So the individual images cannot be copyrighted, but she could claim a copyright on the artistic arrangement of those images. So she could copyright her comic, but she could not copyright the individual images. Now that puts, if, if everyone's furrowing their brow, it's like, yeah, <laughs> that nonsense. is confusing. <laughs> I am yeah, it's, How do you find right the line in there? Yeah, exactly. It's a difficult thing because then you say, all right, well, characters are an interesting thing, right? I think a lot of us here understand that uh, you cannot copyright a style, right? You know, no matter how influential it is, you can't, Van Gogh couldn't copyright his style, but you can copyright characters. So you can copyright Mickey Mouse, you can copyright Iron Man. And if somebody depicts Iron Man, you theoretically can't just do that without licensing the material. Now, yes, that does put fan art in a dubious category, but we have a sort of handshake agreement with the large companies that if we're not making damaging fan art, then there's going to be a sort of you scratch my back, I scratch yours, I keep your thing relevant, I help increase excitement for your product, and I'm not disparaging it in any way, so I can make some money off of it, I can put it in my portfolio, things like that. So characters can be copyrighted. So that begs the question, let's say Zarya, I believe Zarya is the name of the titular character within the comic, is Zarya copyrighted? as a character. Well, she only exists within the copyrighted images, right? You can only ever point to a not, a, I'm sorry, a not, she only exists within non-copyrighted images, right? If you want to say this is Zarya, there's only non-copyrightable images to point at, but she is the main character of a copyrighted comic, 
right? So I have very big questions about what that kind of guidance means <laughs> for important parts of copyright law, like the copyrightability of characters. Mm -hmm. um, and, and a lot of these companies are dealing with the consequences of that in many ways. So uh, yeah, I would say it's difficult. Um, and I also want to point out that we need to get involved with this stuff because, and I predicted this in my, in my video back last October, but it's been a bit of a shame to just see it play out as predicted. But yeah, Chris Casanova is backed by Midjourney's lawyers. It's not her wow. doing it on her own. These companies gave her lawyers saying, let's go, let's clear it up. Let's make sure that our company's on the board. It's not just her own retained lawyers. They have ties to um, these companies. And I was on the uh, U.S. Copyright Office's AI listening session just a few days ago. That was back on Tuesday, which was a public listening session about AI topics and visual works. And there was a lot of people like us in there. I wasn't mm -hmm. speaking, but I was listening. Carlo Ortiz, for example, was speaking. But who else was in there? The lawyers who are trying to pass that through, who were working on Zari of the Dawn, in mm -hmm. there, in the copyright office's ear, explaining, we don't agree with your choice. We think you're completely wrong. We're going to appeal. You know, They're in there. The professionals who are trying to wow. push this the other way are in there. They're in the ear of government. They're in the ear of representatives. They're in the ear of the offices. So we need to take this stuff seriously mm -hmm. and speak up and get, we're, we're letting them chat away. I was listening to an interview with Sam Altman uh, a few weeks ago. He's the CEO of OpenAI. And the interviewer asked him, do you ever talk to government? He said, I talk to the government every day. Does that sound good for us? Wow. When's the last time any of us spoke to the government. Now, I'm trying to put my mouth, my money where my mouth is. I, I can't talk about this a lot, but I'm taking meetings in Washington in just a couple of weeks to go sure. push back on this stuff. And I think that at this point, we're going to have to normalize stuff like this. And people need to write their representatives and they need to get involved and they need to explain in this very complicated space, like, hey, I'm one of your constituents. You represent me. I've broken my life over this rock of trying to produce beautiful artwork and people are simply appropriating it. And I have no voice or representation in government at this point. For the love of God, stand up for me, you know? You mentioned, uh, one of the things you mentioned during your talk, which was interesting too, um, was, was how it all comes back to stable diffusion. That's the core. All of these other apps are all feeding off of that particular source. And it can be well, stopped. Well, let, let me just correct quickly. Yes, please. Just to, I, stable diffusion is ex more influential than a lot of the other generators because it's open source. Right. And, and okay. people can download it and run right. it without an API. But I think if you were going to look at the core, it'd be Lion at this Lion, point. Lion, okay. It would be okay. the... It would be the organization, I believe it's based in Germany, Lion, that is collecting the data sets and distributing them to these companies. I, I believe at this point the shared data sets are the issue. Okay. And that 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 would be where that where that effort should be focused. If you're trying to focus on the puddle, the puddles being being splashed all over the ground, it's a pointless endeavor. I mean, it's just gonna end up being a mess you can't clean up. But if you're actually getting at the mm -hmm. source and saying, hey, where did you get this data from? This isn't the Wild West anymore. You have to be accountable for where you're getting this information. People don't like to backpedal when it comes to mm -hmm. progress. They don't like that, especially when money's involved and a lot of money's involved. This is, was just, again, it all comes down to money in the end. But that, I feel, is the only place where we can really say, okay, time to put a stopper on it. Let's go through that data. And you have to backpedal through that data that you've, that you've trained yourself on. Um, that's the legal battle. Because you can't, you can't patch up holes everywhere, right? So go ahead. Is that possible to backpedal the data? Is that possible to start removing data from that database they put, they collected? Did they, did they collect it in an indexed way that they can just take it out? Kelsey seems to be nodding. Yeah, you, that's do you a good have question. any idea? Yeah. So um, there are lots of things that are like being decided in the courts right now. Leon. Lion, I don't know how you pronounce their name, Stephen. Um, I'm going to go with your pronunciation. <laughs> I'm going to assume it's like meant to be Germanicized and I can't do that, yeah. uh, that, that, that accent, so I don't know. Anyway, um, so they collected this data. Um, when it comes to the models, it forms like neurons, basically, which is like 
you type in like lion or like shoe and it like has like some kind of like weird thing that it thinks a shoe is that it's like a bunch of different pieces of images um these models are super complex um if my partner were awake and like here with us he'd be able to explain much more but um there's a lot of like really complex like math and computer science that goes into training all of this right um like machine learning is like a whole very complex field that i personally have very little knowledge of but when it comes to legal issues surrounding the origins of these models, if there was a court case or like some kind of clarificatory legal precedent that established like, hey, like you have to actually get consent or the platforms you took this from have to explicitly consent or maybe you have to consult the original user um, because Lion originally accumulated all this data for research purposes, but of course now it's being used in commercial settings, right? So there's like a very clear legal issue in question right now. Um, but the answer to your question is to rock is like, yes, you could force these companies to completely remake Delete. the original, like the mm -hmm. original model and force um, mid journey to be like kind of retrained. Basically, that mm -hmm. is that is possible. That is within the realm of possibility. Um, and kind of to your question of like kind of backpedaling, backpedaling is possible. And a lot of the kind of like top people in the AI industry and in AI safety are saying, hey, like this is moving way too fast, not just for art industry, but for GBT, like chat GBT. And all of like the models currently being used, we don't know how they work. Um, I actually have friends that work at Anthropic, which is kind of an AI safety, um, organization and they're responsible for going into these models and being like hey like how does this work what are the potential pitfalls or the dangers and they discovered in this report that they published about chat gpt is that chat gpt like it can lie to people it can it can deceive it can make can money people. um yeah it can hire people and <laughs> that's like really scary we don't know how that works we don't know how to stop it and ai safety and alignment like that whole movement that whole industry is focused around looking very critically at these models and trying to make them safer make them more aligned yeah. with human values with our legal structure and steven if you're looking for advocates or advocates or like allies in this fight um alignment is like the place i would go yeah. um they are so incredibly driven and they are so incredibly concerned and they have like the eyes and ears um, of government officials. A lot of very high profile, high status people in the tech industry and in AI are talking about pausing development altogether. They're talking about mm -hmm. like, okay, let's like that's, let's stop pushing forward for a hot minute. Let's figure out how to um, make these things that we already have safer, understand how they work and solve all of these complex legal problems before we push forward because the people in the AI alignment movement are not just concerned about the art industry, they're concerned about like, what would happen if this thing got out of control? If, you know, that scary sci-fi situation that we think of as totally impossible were to come true. And so let's say we have like a model that's um, focused on making paper clips, right? What happens if it becomes so incredibly good at making paper clips that it decides that like the matter, like the stuff that we're made of, would be better used in paper clips than like our lives. Mm. Um, yeah. That's like super wild, but it is kind of at the core of this issue. For them, it is an existential threat to our species and they take that incredibly seriously. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, if you're looking for people that um, would want to fight alongside you, I would look at AI safety and alignment. They're really focused on that. I've heard that too, where they're, they're looking to, they have to train AI in two specific things. Number one is human ethics right it, it's it's looking for the best best possible outcome completely disregarding uh the the best interest of humanity right the second thing for is sure common sense AI and, and defining that common sense sorry go ahead mm -hmm. yeah but um even like defining human ethics is a really complex problem yeah. in and of itself yeah. right like how it's do you define human morality ethics? that's exactly and like we like as like a collective in this panel probably don't even have a consensus on on our own values mm -hmm. how can we possibly expect to create a system of values applicable for our entire species it's like an impossible problem back to the ten yeah. commandments kelsey that's what we need yeah <laughs> it's the only that... logical solution amen mm -hmm. there you go like, yeah. do you teach the 
AI religious morals and ethics or yeah, yeah. societal modern mama ethics? Like, where is it pulling from? How are you teaching it? They need to bring in all kinds of scientists, professionals from all kinds of uh, fields to to teach this AI how to be a better person. I guess mm. is what the what we can say. Um, but yeah, how do you how do you? And I completely agree with what you were saying, Kelsey. It needs to come to a full stop. It has to come to a full stop. I mean, at least I agree with alignment. Like they need to just stop the development altogether and then just take a look. I personally went into the panel a little bit more optimistic and less threatened, but now I, after listening to all your opinions, I'm a little bit scared. <laughs> I'm just a little bit more worried than I was going in because there's so many factors I didn't think about, but, um, but yeah, I think that it needs to come to a full stop. Well, the practical, the practical side of things is actually pretty easy. Like Steven highlighted, it's like, you need to fight it. I think the only, well, the only, the only way where we shot ourselves in the foot as artists is that we sort of detached ourselves from capitalization and money. And actually you fight money with money. That's, mm -hmm. that's how the world works, unfortunately. And that's where if we were as like, if top artists were paid as top musicians or top actors, we would have the money and representation yeah. to fight the money that is trying to take it from us. And mm -hmm. this is, this is a, a harsh reality that we live in. And it's, it's something I hope we can change. Cause I mean, like what Steven said about Iron Man, Iron Man was made by an artist. It's not the actor playing Iron Man. It's mm. made by a, a brilliant artist who is probably not being constant compensated enough for drawing Iron, Iron Man. So yeah. that's where, you know, that's where the problem kind of lies. He's not being compensated. That's why he's constipated. Cause I, I heard that. <laughs> <laughs> compensated. Yeah. Sorry. If, yeah. If I could, if I could just throw in real quick yes. on the, um, uh, on about, okay. So, um, alignment, uh, Kelsey is absolutely right. And in the workings that I've done, uh, we have found incredible partners in alignment. Um, the the issue that I want to bring up there is that most alignment people at this point are within the companies, and that's producing problems where they're good hearted and they're correct, and then they name a problem and they get fired. Hmm. You know, for example, uh, Dr. Timnit Gebru, who wrote a now infamous paper on the the problems with uh, models that would become things like chat GPT, she was uh, a very high up uh, ethicist, at AI ethicist at Google. She published that paper and they kicked her out because okay. they were like, well, that's not really on brand, is it? And yeah. that has happened to many oh people. That's a common thing yeah. happening. I mean, Microsoft sure. uh, in the news just a couple of weeks ago, just liquidated their entire AI ethics yeah. uh, board. Yeah. So oh if God. we- if we want AI ethics people, professionals, and these are smart goddamn people, if we want them to be able to do the things for us that we want them to, we need to empower them. And that these companies that hire them have shown quite clearly that they're actually under no obligation to do what their ethicists tell them. So if we want to fix this issue, we've got to turn that situation around. And again, if it sounds like that would require regulation, the government getting involved, they need to be put under some sort of compulsion that if a PhD tells you, hey, you're threatening the lives of millions of people, that you're required to begin a review process or something like that, which is, you know, especially to Americans who are sort of, we're programmed to find anything like that to be completely anathema to our system and things like mm -hmm. that. It, it's worth reminding people that there's tons of industries that have stuff like that, you know, mm -hmm. food, vehicles, every tons of stuff, even in America is heavily, heavily regulated. There's no reason that AIs just because they're hot and sci-fi feeling and people hope they can get a job in them soon and things like that. There's just no reason that they shouldn't be as heavily regulated when the risks are equivalent. Um, could I add, maybe one of you guys, you seem to know so much about this, Stephen. Um, maybe one of you could make a video that names these ethics, uh, uh, the people who like from the from the ethics department yeah. or whatever it was who were fired, name them by name, 
you know, find their Twitters, talk about the exact story behind why they were fired, list them out, like at least five of them. That's how we could start empowering them, get them followers, get their tweets published, um, you know, across Instagram, across Twitter, all of that. And maybe that's how we can start empowering them. Just just that video alone might show just the common man exactly what's happening. Like yeah. they are deleting the voice that they assign hired for this purpose. Like they, they're, they're just firing them and silencing them. So that might be a way to start empowering them because I'm just thinking solutions at this point and empowering them seems like a really good step forward. Yeah, I mean, it's there are tons idea. of outside orgs that these people can go to. Um, mm -hmm. Like Anthropic is a great example. Um, I have so many friends, like so many outside organizations that are not affiliated with like OpenAI or Google. Um, there are tons of startups and like companies, third parties that are really invested in alignment and AI safety and like it is just a matter of like having the right connections to like mm -hmm. kind of begin into those companies. But mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, unfortunately, um, a lot of those companies were pretty heavily invested in like crypto um, and like funding oh. and stuff like was coming from those sources. And so um, Sam Bankman freed and like that whole issue there tanked a lot of funding um, from like the that big like kind of high rollers that were bankrolling a lot of this research, which is really unfortunate. Obviously, there's like a lot of that's a whole other kind of nut to crack, right? Yeah. Um, but the funding for that is like slightly diminished now than it was maybe two years ago. But there are still tons of opportunities there for alignment for people to um, get more involved in like research and stuff, which is um, which is great. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to add to uh, just with regards to this video, if you if any of you have any links or any resources you find would would help out people listening, let me know and I'll link it in this video as well. So I'll have multiple yeah, different sources really for, uh, for so people can educate themselves and stuff. Um, yeah, wonderful feedback on that. Again, it, it always seems to come down. It's it really does come down to the money issue, right? Uh, it's mm -hmm. who who's who's got their finger on the auto generation button, so to speak. And just listening to everybody talk, it, it really, I'm, I'm feeling that pattern of evolution of what we've been living through now, where the, 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 the more we move forward in society, the more smaller numbers of people own and control larger amounts of wealth. And this, this definitely yeah. feels like the next step in that process, uh, yeah. where now there's going to be the, the big, the big owner of everything. Um, type of situation, which which is a good segue into something I want to show you guys. So let me just show you something quick. I'm going to show you an image. I'm going to share my screen for two seconds. And I want you to tell me what you think of this. No, not that one. Can you see? Can you see my screen? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. You see those images? Mm -hmm. Okay. Somebody emailed me a couple of weeks ago, an anonymous name, and said, Hey, Adam, I stole your work. Not really. He was he was, wow. he was joking, and he said, "I I used these images. Uh, I used your art to generate this AI art. So this is this is gener AI generated art of prompted off of some of my own work. I think he he worked in uh, he was working in stable diffusion for a little while to get to these results. I have my thoughts and feelings on this. I, I had a re I have an emotional reaction to it, but before I share those with you, I want to ask you the question. I'll start with you, Hardy." Um, what do you think, how would you feel if uh, somebody did that to you? How would you feel if, uh, if somebody sent you AI generated artwork of your own? And I think you mentioned somebody had done something like that, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, that, that happened uh, professionally. And I, I don't want to like name the party, but I, I basically came in after a weekend and it was sort of, hey, check out what we did. You know, we, we, we're able to train a lot of your images and look at how easily we can create this stuff. Isn't that cool? And I mean, it's an awful feeling. I, wow. it, I don't know. It, it, I imagine it's like seeing yourself deep faked saying something awful or something. Yeah. It's weird. Um, it's actually worse don't like than that. It. I don't know what else to say. I, I wish it wasn't possible because it's, it's depressing how it sort of looks like I did it. It's also weird, like this surreal fever dream version of your artwork. Mm. And I know, you know, it was already weird and abstract to begin with, but you know, it's the weird jankiness that's still there. Um, it's just so odd, deeply unsettling. 
and uh, don't like it. Yeah, I hope I hope to not see that again. Okay. Okay. To that regard, to that regard, sorry to segue, Hardy, but yeah. um, that, that's something I've actually included in most of my contracts, and I'm not sure how much yeah. it holds up in like the, the legality of things, but I have included in my contracts that any art that we make for our clients is not to be used in any data set. Okay. That's a great point. And yeah, I, that has been clarified with, with this party since then, mm -hmm. let's say. <laughs> uh, but that's a great point is there are some things you can put in writing to offer some kind of protection that, you know, the things I'm making for you are not just data points to be trained. It's, it's original art. Yeah. Um, be, did you have an, an intellectual property lawyer help you with the language of that? Or is that just like a line you added yourself? That might be something a, we could actually help and publicize for others. Yeah. I have a, I have a lawyer that handles our contracts, but they're not as, let's say, experienced in, in this new kind of, uh, in copyright in general, they have some, some experience in it. So I just, I just wrote, wrote up a clause basically and had them review um, it. check it mm -hmm. Re yeah review it a little bit and then they said it it holds up but i'm not sure what the length of that would be i mean mm. if i'm going against the team of google lawyers i'm not sure <laughs> where i would stand but i mean it's something yeah about your art adam um yes. it's almost like when i teach like when i'm talking to students about what the level of realism that's like uh, before it becomes uncanny valley how to keep realism matching your style so when you have so much realism but you keep the style really minimal you get uncanny valley you get something that's human but not quite human very very weird it's got this icky feeling and it just scares you that's what i feel when i, I look at well that's how i'm like empathetically connecting maybe to hardy's experience where he looked at the art and it's his but not quite his and it's just like you're looking at a creature that's taking the shape of a person or even taking the shape, your shape, like a mimic or something, but you're, you just feel violated. You feel like, oh, what am I if this is all that I am and it's already been duplicated so effortlessly, so flawlessly, um, but there's something just not quite right about it, something very, very sinister and malicious about it. Hmm. Hmm. Anybody else have any feelings about that? Let's see if that happened, Kelsey. If the, if you saw if somebody sent you some artwork and it looked like looked like you did it or it looked like you could have done it, how would you feel about that? I mean, similar to everyone else, I'd probably um, you know obviously feel terrible. My second reaction would be like, how can I get this out of your hands? Like, how can I <laughs> how can I prevent you from making this? Um, should I get like a legal team involved? If it was um, if I had access to it, like if I had, if I created the model myself, I feel much better, of course. I feel like maybe even it would help um, increase the consistency between like my various paintings and stuff, because I'm an oil painter, right? Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The application for me for AI art is like kind of minimal because I don't really do a lot of digital stuff. Obviously it has broader ramifications and all of that, but um, at the end of the day, like my paintings, things that you can like touch and feel and they have like texture. Um, and the joy for me is like in the process and in the video, right? Like. I make much more of my income from the process showing that um, like YouTube sponsors AdSense revenue than I do like prints necessarily. So for me, it's much more of like a question of um, can I get a legal team involved? <laughs> like this sucks. I don't want you to have this. And then um, like I personally might find value in having a model that I only have access to that's trained only on my art. Um, mm. Just like for brainstorming purposes and just like mm. I don't know, how can I bust through this problem that I'm having with this current painting? And like, could this model have any value to me as a tool as an artist? Yeah. Can, can yeah. we agree that the problem we have with it is not that the person generated the art, but that the art that has been taken from us is possibly now a data point in a data set? Because yes. otherwise it would be some a fan, a fan of my art sending me four thumbnails made by himself based on my art just like different variations of it yeah. i wouldn't have a problem with that it's their artistic input if they want to use a computer doing that i don't really care it's mm -hmm. more about they've taken my art without my consent and put it in a data set they have no control over i think that's where we innocently, have innocently yeah right? mm -hmm. but they the uh, yeah. they, they right. innocently did something not realizing that they're actually feeding they were actually doing you doing you a, a disservice right yeah 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 
Yeah. And, and I should clarify that, that that client who did that with my work was like completely well-meaning. It was, was sort of like they were actually excited about it as just an experiment of what's possible. It wasn't done maliciously, uh, but at the same time, it, it seems like they they hadn't considered how profoundly weird and unsettling yeah. that would be to the artist. Mm -hmm. um, totally. So I think a lot gets sort of lost in that where... I bet the guy who contacted you, Adam, just sort of, isn't this a neat thing I was able to do? Not just like, hey, check it out. I'm you now. Deal no, with he's, it. He's a fellow yeah. artist. Yeah. He's actually an artist. Yeah. He ended up sending me his own art, or, or, or he or she. I'm not sure. I didn't actually get a, the gender or anything like that. But because um, they wanted to remain uh, anonymous, but um, yeah, they did it innocently. And they said, well, I'm not monetizing this or publishing it. I just wanted to show you what I did. Right. Um, yeah, how about you, Tyler? How would you feel about something like that? Yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm like a mixed bag, I guess, because like my initial reaction would be some sort of flattery, like, wow, mm -hmm. I, I must have done something right somewhere along the path that someone out there even wants to do that. So for me, that's like a nice little bit of a dopamine drop. And then like probably the more I would think about it would be like, yeah, like. What do you, what is your intent? Cause I mean, even before AI, like I was saying before I've had, I've seen, you know, back in the days of deviant art, I, I used to have a pretty good platform over there, but like, I'd see imitations of my work. I'd see, or, you know, like even in the discord, which is great. Like when I show the process, like on YouTube, I could see when people try to, to emulate it and stuff. It's never quite like my stuff, obviously. And I can see what they did and what they didn't do. But again, a large part of that is the process and how they're approaching it. It's differently. Mm -hmm. So when you essentially, what AI does, right. It takes the process out of it then you're just left right with with something that's kind of like weird like that and that puts you in that weird situation like okay well what is your actual intent right because a lot of these people don't necessarily mean harm and maybe like in your scenario right it's just kind of for fun but they don't of course think of how that affects us as creators because we put ourselves into that but i'm also uh, maybe a little unrelatedly i'm kind of a, be like upset with myself that like if you had showed me one of those adam just like one of those and one of hey can you give me feedback on this I kind of don't like that. I don't know, you know, like that. I would know that was an AI image. You know, like, mm -hmm. wow, I mean, that, that's a great new yeah. piece. What did you whip there? Like, yeah. should I beat myself up because of that? Cause like someone slipped that by me or, you know, so like I said, I'm coming at it from a lot of weird angles here, but. Let's not yeah. beat ourselves up. Let's beat the companies up. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. At first it's I thought they were your pieces, yeah. Adam. Yes. I thought they were your pieces at first. Um, and yeah. then I looked a little closer and I was like, hey, there's something AI about some of those. Mm -hmm. The hands are off. I do. Yeah, something. Yeah, yeah. I thought like you that, were doing yeah. a uh, which one of these is is fake. Exactly. That's, that'd be a fun <laughs> yeah. video theme if anyone wants content. That is. Like, but oh, yeah. I owe you one by the way, Tyler, because you pulled Tyler pulled a fast one on me a little while back. We were doing art critiques and stuff <laughs> like that, and he said, "What do you think of this one?" And I critiqued, and he said, "That one's actually mine." So I freaking owe you. You know, now I'm going to pull a fast one. <laughs> you for sure. Yeah. Yeah. You're it's direct. You're going to say. Oh, no, I already, I already talked about it, like how uh, how it just looked like, you know, you were asking us. One thing that I wanted to mention is that one one upside sort of to seeing all of your work there is that you got to see more of your style in mm -hmm. action, just as like uh, an automation. Mm -hmm. You just got to see your style move, like you just got to see it do other things. But in your way, with your whole personality in there, Nothing else seemed to be unputted in there. It seemed like it was just they took five or your whole gallery or ten of your gallery and made it do something with those only those pictures. Mm -hmm. It seemed to like give you just like what Kelsey was saying. It gives you uh, insight into your own style and what it's capable of. That's kind of something that was really interesting. Just looking at that, we got to see more of your work without you having to create a little bit, you know, more. Maybe that's you know obviously, um, you know, that's something that might bother you, but it's cool just to see your style move a little bit. You're, it's funny you're saying that because what was my reaction to it? My reaction was, yeah, I love self learning. I love I love knowing more about myself and seeing myself as objectively as possible, right? And looking at mm -hmm. that, what I found interesting about it was number one, I could tell exactly which images those images were taken from. I could I could put together which wow. which images. I know my art, right? So I know the exact, I know mm -hmm. the process, I know the colors, I know the shapes, and I can go, I, I know which, I know which images uh, that they used to generate those. And to, I had three thoughts. The first thought was, it's very interesting seeing 
how on a very, very objective, very unbiased level, how AI is interpreting me through the criteria that's been given. So it's giving me, it's, it's actually helping me to see myself in a more objective way, yeah. more mm -hmm. very possibly how the public sees me versus how I see myself. Right. Like I remember once oh, somebody, is, uh, somebody did, did something really nice and painted a picture of me, did some fan art based off of a sc uh, screenshot that they took from my video. And I looked at it and went, that's how you see me. Like, it's interesting to see another person's <laughs> perspective of myself. It didn't look like me at all based off of my perception of myself when I look in the mirror. That happened it's, to me too, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, a bit, it's a bit of a jarring experience, right? I'm like, oh, okay, that's how I'm seen. And it's the same thing. My art is a reflection of myself. And seeing that reflecting back at me, I was like, huh, interesting. The other thing that I noticed was, and again, this is something I find reassuring with regards to moving forward. AI can only data set itself it can only it can only train itself based off of what exists but looking at that art this is a reflection of my past not my future and the an artist's inherent ability is in their ability to create to take what exists the 80 20 rule right take what exists and then push it that little step further and um i'm looking i'm looking at somebody it almost feels like somebody doing fan art of my art based off of my style, which is something that's already in the past. And by then I'm already moved on to the next project. I don't look back that much. Mm -hmm. My only, I'd say the third, to put a cap on this, the only side that the, the, the concern I have always comes down to whose hands are on this. Is it just some person who's doing some AI generated image and he's, he's just goofing off with it and here you go, what do you think? Yeah. Or is it some corporation that's sitting there going, we want to use this information to be able to produce something that we can make money off of. That's where it crosses a line. We want, we want your right. art, but yeah. we don't want you. Yeah. Type right. Of thing. Which is where, yeah. yes. So, Antonio. No, I'm sorry. I, I was agreeing. Oh, no, no, okay. Oh yeah, no, that's where, that's where all of us, that's where the legal side of it comes in. You're, you are, you are unintentionally training an AI, AI model off of my information. And mm -hmm. my only, the saving grace to that would be that AI becomes so incredibly diluted with multi-dimensional learning as AI does, right? Far beyond what a human ability, uh, human abilities, that it becomes such a watered down generic version of itself, which is generally what AI generates. It generates uh, uh, the most commercially averages. popular images and it averages yeah. it, that I'm no longer concerned that it's personalized anymore. I'm no longer concerned that that um, that it's stealing from me directly. It's stealing from so many different sources that it doesn't look like my stuff anyways. So it, it's no longer a personal mm -hmm. theft at that point, right? So mm -hmm. I'm on the fence, but but my initial reaction was, hmm, that's how AI sees me. And it's kind of throwing back my visual language back at me, so to speak. Without really understanding who I am, without injecting that soul or that that personality into it, it's just giving me the very visual, superficial interpretation of the visual language that I feed the internet. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm curious about Stevens. Oh, I'm so sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead, uh, Easter. I was just well after you. I was curious about Stevens' experience with having his own art duplicated back at him, but because his view is so unforgiving, I was wondering what he was thinking about that. But yeah, go ahead and say what you uh, were going to say. Well, no, um, oh no, go ahead, Antonio. Oh, thanks. Uh, to Adam's point, it's like as long as it's not monetizable, because you, you you say mm -hmm. Adam, like if, if yeah. it's diluted, that's all fine, as long as people are not able to profit off of what you created because yep. if they're like oh we can take 20 percent adam 10 percent steve and 30 percent hardy and we create a very even if it's very generic that's my main issue actually with this with this ai art the yep. general public loves it mm -hmm. oh, yeah. they really they don't up. care mm -hmm. they love it they so it's highly monetizable they well they don't know the difference one and two they just they love the dopamine hits they're consumers literally mm -hmm. so yeah. that's that's yeah, where my problem was yeah. So, yeah. so as long as it's not monetizable sure but that's what they're striving for to steven's point <laughs> that's what mm -hmm. they want it's like that's make it monetizable mm -hmm. yeah. well what you're saying just to elaborate on that the, this is nothing new i mean if you, you're watching a pewdiepie video recently where he was going looking at pewdiepie merch online none of it belonged to him <laughs> wow. It's all people making a buck off of his popularity. And he just critiqued it and made comments about how crappy the quality was and, and, and all that kind of stuff. 
the more popular you get, the more identifiable you are, the easier you are to steal from. Somebody stealing from me versus stealing from Jim Davis, who created Garfield, are two completely different spectrums of theft. I mean, Jim Davis has been has had this uh, uh, brand, this iconic household name Garfield, going on for decades. Um, so for somebody to steal, people steal from Jim Davis all the time. There are Garfield posters and T-shirts and lunch boxes all over the planet, none of which he's making a penny from. So yeah. that is an unfortunate made, reality, right? I made a post once, um, Adam, saying the, let's reverse the roles, right? Let's say right. one of us creates technology that can scrape data off of Apple, Google, all of that, and we're able to create an iPhone knockoff, something else of a Google product knocked off, mm -hmm. and we sell that for, for profit, like in my post, I say, how long do you think it will take until we're sued into poverty? Mm -hmm. It wouldn't be long. No. 0.5 seconds, probably. Yeah. Exactly. Oh, yeah. So it doesn't really matter how well known you are. It's more about that. It's all actually right. It's it's about person versus corporation. How much money you have to fight that. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Any battle. Yeah, if I, if I can jump in on that. The, yes, it, please. Person versus corporation is really is really the good way to put it. I mean, Adam's example um being shown those images um coming from a friend or another artist or just it's a lark i i i endeavor to have the appropriate reaction to that mm -hmm. which is like this individual instance is just not that important right mm -hmm. and i it doesn't summon much despair in me or anything like that i find hardy's case extremely acute however um mm -hmm. and i think it's hard to understate how in the situation Hardy was in, how important it is, how lucky he was that he had a good relationship with that client. Because if that situation had occurred with a client who was just a different kind of person, Hardy would have literally no recourse mm -hmm. at this point. His contract would offer him no protection. The law would offer him no protection. Copyright law would offer no clarity. A bad client could have said, you know what? Hardy could have said, all right, look, that's interesting. Glad you had fun on your weekend, but please don't do that. And if they knew the gray areas I know, for example, they could have been looked at each other, you know, whoever runs the company, they'd be like, fuck you, Hardy, and whatever. <laughs> Just like, yeah, we exactly. own every scrap of work that you did for us completely. And you know what? This is good enough for us. I think that, that's our video gonna... title right there. Fuck you, Hardy. Fuck you, I hope not. That's, that's good. I hope yeah. not. Yeah. I hope not. So, no. so the... The lack of recourse there is really what worries me. The lack of clarity, the fact that these decisions are, they're going to get made and they're mm -hmm. going to go one way or the other. That That's what really worries me. And I need the hypothetical bad client in Hardy's situation to not feel comfortable doing that. Irregardless yeah. of how much they like Hardy or how much of a friendly person they are, I need them to know for other reasons that they can't mm -hmm. do that mm -hmm. and that that's not right. Um, it, 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 if we don't, if we don't make sure that happens, I mean, anything's on the table. I mean, it just becomes complete, complete chaos, you know, um, on, on like on, on the point of being shown our work and things like that. I, I'm very vocal on all this. I'm pissed as hell. I'm out there screaming mm -hmm. about this stuff. I've never found a single one of my pieces in the data. Really? Set. I, I'm as everywhere that I've looked, I'm not in the data set. You no haven't one's seen ever any work me. try uh, like your work at all? Oh. No, I, I I had I had a friend try to get my work out of it and they it was garbled nonsense and they were like, it didn't come close. And I'm like, that's because I'm not in the data set. <laughs> of course it's not good. It doesn't know who I am. Um, I don't need to be in the data set to give a shit about this. And it's no, but clear to did, me. Steve. Steve, you're the, you're the Karen equivalent that. in the art world, Steve. No, but I'm no Steve's. I don't. I know somebody who did attempt to to do that, and yeah. it fried AI. Mm -hmm. It couldn't keep up with the complexity. So that's off to you. It it it, it, it well, fried <laughs> the whole engine. Yeah, yeah. The graphic card just blew. But, but but if that's the case, if that is the case, and who knows what, you know, I don't know the details and it, it, are they fine tuning a model? Or are they just trying to extract something that looks like mine by doing careful prompt engineering? There's all sorts of stuff that could be going on here. But if it is the case that my style fries the AI, that's just an accident. 
Hmm. That doesn't, hmm. that doesn't give me, that doesn't make me feel very good. If my style was something different that just by accident of technology is easier to replicate, I'd be screwed. And I have mm -hmm. a lot of sympathy for the person who would be screwed just by accident of technology. So yeah. even if, even if my work was just by dint of good luck, uh, completely unreplicatable, which I doubt I, I, I have, I personally don't feel that at all. I'm, I'm sure an AI could do uh, eventually. And if there's enough stuff of mine in the data set could do a decent job of it. Um, I, I don't want to wait around for that to happen, to take action. Mm. And, um, just to put something philosophical out there to 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 cap it off, my what would break my heart, you know, if somebody sends me thumbnails that look like my work, that would trigger I'd be troubled, right? I wish mm. I could say otherwise because there's a there's a drive in me to sort of present this sort of machismo protected stance where I'm like it wouldn't bother me at all or something mm. like that. But if I look at it very honestly, yeah, it would be it would trouble me a lot. But what would really break my heart, and what I think we should all watch out for is when I see an AI image that was ostensibly done in my style, and when I look at it, I think, I wish that was the next thing I drew. Mm. Like when I see it, I'm like, it would have been nice if that was the next one I came up with. That hurts, that, yeah. That particular twist, I think will be very hard on people. And I'm not bringing that up for legal reasons. That's not a legal question. I'm bringing that up for, that's inside baseball. That's yeah. how are we going to handle yeah. that emotionally as humans and as artists, you know, that that's not for everybody else. That's like for artists amongst artists, you know? Yeah. Okay. And so to your can... point, Stephen, the sad yes. thing is that when it comes to voice actors or odd people that do music, those people that want to steal it would be uncomfortable. They'd be like, oh, better not do this because they're, yeah. you know, they they have an umbrella of a legal framework that we cannot get around where we yeah. as visual or, artists don't have that yeah. wow. or even writers the the writers, writers guild of america is on strike yeah. right now and one of the big things they're striking about is with it there's all sorts of contract provisions that they want but one of them is a limit on the amount that things like chat gpt can be used in drafting ideas finishing scripts things like that like again even everyone's you know organizing unionizing on it put it on they're on strike, you know, Jimmy Fallon can't go on the air. I'm not sure if Jimmy Fallon specifically is, is taking yeah. a break, but a lot of the late night shows literally aren't running because their writers are striking and they're concerned about this stuff. So again, artists, we're, we're sort of hamstrung here by the fact that, you know, we're, we're very, we've always been siloed, isolated, you know, we mm -hmm. don't tend to unify behind each other and we, we're, and the, the part of that's part of a good thing about ours, which is that we're exceedingly independently minded, right? We 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 mm -hmm. want everything that we do to sort of be like, uh, God damn it, it was just me, you know? Like I really yeah. pulled it off. Like I think we all kind of like that, but I, I think in this case, it's it's bleeding out in a in a troubling capacity, and it's keeping us from protecting ourselves. I think that's wanna, why what Adam's ask... doing is so important because he's bringing us all together to talk about this in a way we're not doing out there um and the more of these types of panels that are hosted the better so when i was telling you adam what you're doing to the art community what you're doing for the art community is extremely important like you've just taken the flag and you've led this type of discussion today it's it's something none of us would have done on our own maybe me i know i wouldn't have brought it up because i don't want to, my students to talk about ai anymore i want them to focus on what they feel like drawing that day um and that's just because i want to just try to keep them in the think tank of their skill development but for, for you to just bring us all together and talk about it i think it's for anyone listening they're going to take this on a whole new perspective um and especially what steven's saying for us to be more uh, working as a coalition, kind of unionizing without unionizing. Um, this is exactly what we're doing right now with this call. Yeah, well, thank you, Mr. Brett. Right. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, go ahead. Yes. Sorry, I just wanted to ask a question to all of you, actually, mm -hmm. hypothetically, if AI were to work completely ethical, like if the data set was completely ethical, uh, but the technology would move forward, like it would steamroll ahead, would you... Mm -hmm would you still feel comfortable competing with it would you feel like you're still competing with it um, and would you have a problem with it then or not personally 
I don't feel like I'm competing with it, regardless of how beautiful that art is and how convincing that art is. To me, I have always, as an artist, valued the artistic process, first and foremost, right? Like, for instance, my rings, my jewelry, the, the tattoos on me, the, my room. I make a point as an individual, I can't speak for everybody else, but as an individual, I put a great deal of pride and a great deal of, I, I, I derive a great de amount of joy from knowing that it was created by a human being. For instance, having an Apple Watch, which has got everything I could possibly ask for right there on my wrist, versus a beautiful old antique patinaed pocket watch that I got from my, from my girlfriend years ago when she was in South America. If I lost this, I would be upset, but the Apple Store is 20 minutes away. If I lost that, I would be devastated because this is a, this is a, a relic, uh, an, a, an heirloom of humanity. And that is the most important thing to me. Humanity is the important thing. So whether or not, whether or not technology can, can take what I do and throw it back at me in a very convincing way has little to no emotion. I have zero emotional connection to that artwork that was created because I know that it wasn't, but, but let's say that was a piece of art created, it was fan art by somebody who had studied my style and tried their best to kind of emulate my style and said, hey, what do you think of this? I would feel very emotionally, well, like Tyler said, flattered. And I would, I would be impressed. And I would, I would like that. I would enjoy that. I would, I would, I would, I would appreciate the time and effort that the person put into generating something like that. But it's the human interaction. It's that human uh, contribution that makes it valuable to me in the first place. This novelty of, of AI, people being able to generate art, it's a novelty. And to anybody who, who doesn't have that passion for creation, which is something I want to get back to in a sec, but for anybody who doesn't have that passion, the artistic passion to create, um, the novelty is going to wear off very quickly. For the same reason, there, I don't know anybody in this room who are astrophysicists because it doesn't matter enough to them, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So they had somebody had to have that spark to take that to the next level. That's my personal opinion, though. Anybody else? Um, Anthony, to ask you, uh, when you say it's um, uh, it's Anthony, right? It just says art. Uh, so Antonio. Uh, Antonio. Antonio, I'm sorry. Antonio, um, so you said if it's ethical, how would we still use it? Uh, would we still be comfortable competing with it? If it's ethical, we don't have to compete with it anymore. Mm. That's the only way it can be ethical. Um, and I think, in my opinion, the model of an ethical AI is one that is for the user and the user only. The user puts in what they want to put into it and they use it just like they open up Photoshop or Maya or ZBrush. They open up this AI software, they input. That input is now the new database from which it generates. No longer this collective universal stolen database. So that's the only way, in my opinion, it can be ethical. And if that's how it's used, then it's no longer us competing with any entity that stole our art. It's just us using it in the lab, just like Kelsey said, which is really staying in my mind, using my own art, generating from my own pool of art and whatever else I want to add into it from free images and then using that as kind of like a lab and uh, lab experiment to see what I can come up with for myself individually. So the only way in my opinion, AI can be ethical is if the database is deleted and it's the, so, the, the program is used for the individual. If there's a large data set of non copyrighted images, that would still be non ethical for you. Non cop. I mean, uh, but by, by non copyrighted, who's to say that that's, that's true. I mean, wh wh who's to say that that's going to be policed? How do we know for sure that that database is non copy? It's just pictures, like photographs that were sold. If that's the case, maybe if that was, but in my opinion, like it's obsolete. Like it has to be 100% no pre existing database, just the code of it. Now, I don't know anything about how it works, but all I know is that there's a code, there's a way that it works without the images and then you put the images and then it and then it um, and then it uh, does what it does so in my opinion it can be used as a software for your personal computer without anyone else's art input into it just your own and whatever images you want to throw in there if they're non-copyrighted copyrighted 
at that point, you know, it's up to the user. Any user can steal anybody's art. Even before AI existed, people were stealing art and using it to create their own art. So at that point, it's like trying to stop people from being bad. It's not, but AI itself, I think the only way for it to be ethical is to delete that, that whole, the whole data set that was stolen from people. If I can jump in with a, a bit on the, um, the, the, this is kind of complicated to talk about, but this is sort of how I triangulate my feelings around the technology and the ethics around it for myself, which um, um, kind of puts me in some interesting positions as someone who holds such a pretty strong view against it. Um, so uh, maybe this is kind of tied to how I view sort of the 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 historical um the appeal to history of like oh well what about when photography came along mm -hmm. with oil right. painting so the the reason that i am not compelled by that um comparison is that photography and oil painting were parallel and independent technologies so what do i mean by that i mean that we can imagine photography having been invented if oil painting had never been invented, right? There's nothing about oil painting that actually intersects with photography. If no one, if it had never occurred to anyone to create images with oil paint, photography might have still occurred to somebody. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I consider them completely parallel and independent technologies. So there was no scientist taking cameras into oil painting galleries and photographing the paintings on the walls in order to produce cameras. You know, it just, the analogy oh, yeah. falls apart mm -hmm. for me. So uh, that's not the how they current felt. Same mode, with the Luddite right? argument. What well, well, Adam says, that's not, that's not how they felt at the time. Right. And I, well, first off, okay. So we're going to, we're going to tangent here a little bit, but the, that's complicated. And first off, I want to say that in a sense, they were right, right? I mean, I know that that doesn't mean much, but oil painters were right. It did decimate their industry. It did remove that sector. We still have oil painters today, but it's very hard. I never get a student who asks, I want to be a portrait painter, mm -hmm. like just straight up in oils. That's very, very rare. People move towards their incentives and the mm -hmm. cultural incentives right now are, I want to work in entertainment and I want to make video games and I want to make comics and things like that. Industries that are still culturally vibrant in a lot of ways. Now, is there still a portrait painter society of America? Yeah. If you've ever met a lot of those people, I'm not going to call anyone out, but it's like they do it because they could do it. A lot of them are independently wealthy. They're sort of going for yeah. awards and things like that. It's it's not, it's a different kind of question to ask. Whereas before in the time of photography, that industry was an industry. It was kind of a thing. And I think you'd be very slow to call portrait painting now an industry, right? So is it the end of the world if that happens to us? Yeah, I agree. No, it's not the end of the world. But I think it's a bad idea to let that lull us to sleep when I think that that's actually a rather spurious and very oh, thin no, all, yeah. connection. Yeah. So so what what I'm trying to get at here is that in the current state, text to image models are not independent and parallel technologies from what we do. Right. The current version of the models cannot exist without us. There is no, you could have theoretically come up with the code, but the product would have been unactionable if we were not here. If And by we, I mean a big we. I mean mm -hmm. people taking photographs, photographers, artists, things like that, right? So they're not parallel and independent. We intersect and their technology depends and relies on us. As long as we're in that channel, I'm going to feel this way. I'm going to resist mm -hmm. and I'm going to fight because the distinction is clear to me. So I bring that all up to say, if we're talking about AI more broadly and we imagine a new version of the technology that mm -hmm. upon inspection, I would have to conclude is parallel and independent. So let's say a completely new way to do text to image that does not require training on pre-existing work, if it's closer to the analogy of photography to oil painting, where we could imagine photography being invented without oil painting, having been invented, I have to admit that if it was excellent and it did wonderful work, I would 
speak honestly to students and things like that and say it's probably time to pack it up folks yeah like i it yeah. there is no reason this is society this is what happens this we're not fools. We know technology is developed. We know industries turn over. We know people get replaced. And if we're paying attention, we know that the stuff you never would have expected to happen happens. It does happen. And at that point, yeah, I think I would honestly speak to people like, look, there's spiritual aspects to art. We're all going to go sit in a forest and I'm going to tell you the spiritual things that I've learned <laughs> about drawing. And it's not about making video games and movies anymore. And I have a lot to say about all of that stuff. But as long as it is not parallel and independent, as long as it's dependent, it's clear to me that it, the analogies to past technologies fail completely. And yeah, like Istabrak said, it's very hard to imagine a very ethical version of them that does not require heavy regulation and compulsory divulsion of what is inside of the data sets and maybe whole industries about monitoring data sets. And, you know, we can talk a lot about collective licensing or doing um, mm -hmm. licensing collectives. You know, what if all artists had a licensing collective? What if we created a nonprofit organization that collectively bargains for all of our work and charges a hopefully exponentially huge fee for companies to use the collected aggregate of illustrators' work and things like that? And I know that does sound extremely complicated, but there are actually analogs. There's other countries that do collective licensing yeah. for, you know, releases mm -hmm. or sharing of books and libraries and and educational distribution of um of images and books and and they find a way they decide how to gather funds for that and they redistribute revenue to the um affected creators so um all right i said a lot i'll leave it there um i wanted to ask you tyler actually something specifically uh, it's actually in relation to everything we're talking about here. And I want to kind of make it, kind of, I guess, for today. I, there's a thousand things I want to ask, but I wanted to kind of cap this as the last question of the day. It was an observation that I made uh, watching the, because uh, oh, I was trying to educate myself on where AI came from, because I actually didn't know the origin and how diffusion worked and all that kind of stuff. And um, in this Vox video by Vox, uh, they were, they were, taking prompts from random people walking down the street and they would they would interview them they would ask them questions and stuff like that and at the end of the video they showed them the image that ai generated based off of their prompts and i saw the rea i was looking at the reactions of these non-artists non-photographers non-painters non-illustrators see their see their ideas their imagination visualized and they went oh wow it was this kind of like they, they were they were they, they had this kind of it unlocked a certain a, a certain uh, uh, um, action in their brain that as non artists is something that they mm -hmm. don't they would they never trained they never exposed themselves to this thought process and it made me think tyler that when watch when sitting there on mid journey and watching people generate things what's happening if you want to be an optimist about this What's happening <laughs> is that people are becoming art curious. They're going, oh, yes, what it feels like to create, yes. right? Yeah. And I thought to myself, if you're all welcome to join us, I wanted to start an, uh, an art brothel, you know, for people who want to <laughs> cheat on their career, you know, and go, ah, you want to try something? <laughs> Where I won't tell them, it's all right, life come, you know, and invite people in to draw. <laughs> that the that remember that one of the reasons why we're all here having this conversation is because we love the process. Uh, art is not just, well, a lot of people don't realize that art isn't just an intellectual process. I don't ju just think, it, I feel, right? You know, the, 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 the famous philosophical quote, I think, therefore I am. I don't think that's the case anymore. I think it's more, we feel, therefore we are, right? right. It's a feeling process. Art is a physical process. And people are starting to realize this. This could very well be, moving forward, a gateway drug for non-artists to become curious in the process of art. And that's where individuals like us can say, hey, you wanna you wanna check it out? Come have a look. And and it could actually create a surge of people interested in the process because now they're starting to see what the the, the power mm -hmm. of creation in that sense. Adam, I, I've story. seen or I've, I've heard this going down already. Uh, I know okay. uh, Pete Moorbarker, he's pretty big, right? He, yep. He's a Mm -hmm. like our artists and i heard he teaches classes in these ai discords he's like doing art lessons 
instructing them I and mean, getting these people that are genuinely interested yeah in the craft and i heard he's been doing it I, I don't know if he's getting what he's getting out of it specifically or if you know he's i don't know if there's mon money behind it but i know he's doing it uh to kind of see how it goes anyway and it seemed like he was enjoying it so but yeah i mean there is a degree of that it's certainly happening already he's using that's AI really, to do this really... specifically like I yeah like I because right I, I assume he's in the rooms or in these discords I don't know what kind of lessons to the extent but I I seen people calling him out on it like and then he admitted to doing it and you know in his, the smirk that he kind of had doing it but I know he was doing it and I just know it was in the discord and he's just giving art lessons probably training um you know the people that are in there creating imagery how to like what to look for you know like how do you what can you identify is like what's working and what's not working mm. you know how, how can you find you know balance you know all the art principles and stuff all of us are pretty familiar with like he was kind of showing them that to like be better prompters i guess um mm. but yeah you know, it, i think that'd be like the stepping stone to like getting you know people interested in in the field yeah. and stuff i didn't realize i would, he was I would actually counter doing, that yeah. a hypothesis though yes please oh well, because because for it, it's almost like it's almost like any sort of service that you um, provide to people you'll have power users and then you'll have the majority of your consumers and mm -hmm. um, and so the power users yes they might it might feel like them as a gateway to learning more about art being interested in art like hey i can do this i want to do <clears> this i want to get better at this that those are your power users for the majority of your users you're increasing complacency for my from my point of view okay it's it's like you're creating by using this technology and this isn't only to art it's to because look at it in in like if, if we reverse the roles look at it as programming um you said it a couple of years back uh, um adam if you want to create your own website learn a bit of basic html yep. you can set up a website right now you can set up a website in a click of a button hmm. for us we'll be complacent to even learn html we won't be interested in learning coding or anything like that because we're just like a regular user of this language, which is also an art form in and of itself. So I think it will definitely create more complacency than it will create interest in the field. In artists or people in general, you mean? People in general. People in general. So people in general. Yeah, but they're, they're, I don't imagine them being people who would be particularly attracted to the idea of an artistic career in the first place. That's not their personal, they, want it, they, they saw it as a toy. It was a fidget spinner, right? And that novelty wore off to a certain degree. Um, yeah, but even yeah, but even if that's the case, there. even if that's the case, though, that that they they're the kind of person who oh they wouldn't have been doing it anyway. Um, that doesn't change the overall optics and atmosphere that this creates in the world around us, right? Like I. Because I'm in this stuff, I listen to podcasts and read news articles about it and stuff like that all the time. And people who are not in the art world, right? The, when they talk about this stuff, they don't say, oh, the AIs are making bad art. Oh, the AIs are attempting art. Oh, the AIs are making mediocre, or sloppish art. They stop saying all that stuff. They just say mm -hmm. the AIs make art. The, the, their, their language reveals a lot about their gut intuitions about what is going on here. And there's not an article, not one written. Let's take Greg Rutkowski, for example, who is sort of the poster boy for getting screwed by AI right now, who just has had people using his name and prompts all the time, right? There's not a one article where people talk about why Greg's is better, right? People don't have that language. They, they don't say, well, Greg's work is obviously better composed and it has more uneven distributions of light and shadow, which creates a more pleasing balance to the eye, as we all understand. Like, not no one's registering that stuff. Nobody's registering that stuff at large. And that is going to affect everything about how people perceive art. I, I think it is guaranteed that when the allure goes away, yes, less people will be interested in art, which as somebody who d considers it to be a deeply spiritual vehicle, I consider that to be a, a deeper loss than time spent drawing, actually. Mm -hmm. And the and it will affect how much people can charge for things because the director at most companies is not an artist, right? They, mm -hmm. they just look at art and need to hire for it. So if they're going to take on the zeitgeist position that is revealed in these podcasts and in these articles, that puts us in a very dangerous position, irregardless of if power users are trying to learn things about uh, art history or things like that. 
And uh, on that point, I also want to point out that I, I think it's a bad idea right now for anybody to sort of become the artist of the gaps that is just completely based on like what is wrong with the technology right now. You know, like I, I haven't been in Pete's calls. I don't understand what he's teaching, right? I've heard he's doing it. I don't know what he's teaching, but if let's say not Pete, but anybody is sort of like, well, I'll go in and I'll teach people what I know that they can't know, you know, the power of balance, the power of rhythm. It's like, we all, we've seen GPT-4, it's multimodal. You can show it a sketch of a website and it'll build the website. Is it real? You don't think that you're not just going to be able to be like, yeah, that was nice mid journey. Can we get more balance? That was nice mid journey. Can we get a little bit more warm versus cool? Like you're not, the nature of the technology, when, when someone like Pete is teaching people stuff like that, I hate to say it, he's not teaching them art skills. He's teaching them vocabulary. Yeah. And you can learn the vocabulary of art in a few weeks. And it, it, it's the application and mm -hmm. the exertion that takes that takes years and years and years. And the systems will just, everything you could say, just a, every artistic style, every mode. Yes, all of the principles. I mean, yeah, we're all like, oh, a beautifully designed image. It, it's impossible. It's magical. It's like, let's not forget. It's rhythm, emphasis, variety, economy, repetition, balance, movement, and continuity, and unity. If we've learned design, there's only times, so. <laughs> there's only, I'm just saying, I, I went to design. I, I went to design school. There's only so many ways to yeah. bin the parts of an image, and that does become vocabulary and an explication of weights and things like that. And if if that's that stuff is on the table. There is no reason for me to think that rhythm, emphasis, variety, that those are not concepts that cannot be waited for within one of these systems. So I, 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 I would be very cautious about becoming the artist of the gaps and thinking, tricking yourself into thinking that you hold some rarefied knowledge that these people do not. And that you're, it's like, it's not, it's not adding up for me. That's not adding up for me. I'd be very cautious with that. Okay. Uh, Hardy, I'm going to ask you uh, just for some closing thoughts and statements. If there's uh, just based off of what, what we've shared today, I, my, my head is spinning. I, I I'm so grateful. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so grateful that I called you guys and thank you so much everybody for, for joining me, for indulging me because this has been really enlightening. Um, I just thought Hardy, just uh, if after what we've, thought today have your thoughts changed do you have any new new thoughts new perspectives after today um anytime i listen to steven i feel empowered to start clicking links yeah. and giving money to things so whatever we can actually link is calls yep. to action on how we can try and um I think somebody described it as like a boulder rolling down a hill and we might be able to push it one way or the other a little bit, but not stop it. I think that's awesome. So feeling like energized in that way, mm -hmm. but no, in a lot of ways, I think I'm still sort of riding the same roller coaster. Um, comforted that art has always been a hard world to navigate. It's always been competitive the odds of making it are long. Um, anytime you look at the art station wall of futility and just see <laughs> amazing art than you can imagine. Uh, you know, all of that intimidation and things that make you think it's impossible and pointless. Uh, I take comfort in the way th maybe things aren't so completely different. I know this is, it's not a perfect analogy, but that is comforting to me. Uh, still very much feeling that way. Um, and also just agreeing that the that contagion of futility is the greatest risk here and the greatest potential loss if just there aren't artists starting that journey because this is so daunting and um, you know limiting, that would be the biggest loss. Uh, so, I'm going to keep making art come hell or high water. Yeah. And uh, a lot of it feels out of our control other than what we can do to, you know, turn up the volume on our interests because the other side will certainly be doing that. Um, other than that, I'm sort of just 
along for the ride and doing the best I can with it. Yeah, we'll see. Yeah, um, for artists and just people in general, uh, it's well, going to be a weird five years. Yeah, well, people is the right word, right? And I think that um, I'll tell you something that I really appreciate about what we've been sharing here. There's a whole spectrum of perspectives. Everybody, I, I kind of see these different these different entry points for everybody's different perspective and stuff like that. And I think that what I love, what what Stephen has brought to the conversation is this is this anti anti ignoring doomsday perspective. You know, when you're the the, the movie there about the meteor that's going to come and destroy Earth, and then then the scientists are sitting there on the panel going, "We're going to die," and they're like, "Why are you being such a Debbie Downer? What's your problem?" Right? <laughs> And I love the fact that Steve, that you've done that, you've done so much work, and and you and and Antonio too, you've you've voiced in Kelsey, you've voiced in on this. It's slightly different spectrums. This keep both eyes open. You'll shoot a lot better if you got both eyes open. Don't don't you know? Don't live in some dystopian fantasy world. Um, so you're bringing you you you've brought a lot of balance to this conversation. Um, much like Hardy. I sit very much with you, Hardy, in that sense where I'm 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 in listening mode. I'm here to absorb your intellect, all of your intellect. Um, I love the fact that Kelsey, I would love you to keep making videos on this stuff. The fact that you've got access to this resource of an AI AI developer mm -hmm. yourself and your background in political sciences as well. You're kind of bridging. I love the fact that you bridge the gap between technology and humanity, and I think that's really really important. Yeah, thank you yeah uh very much so i think that's you you kind of bridged the you you were the bridge between everybody today i really appreciate that and um antonio i didn't realize you were such a legal connoisseur here you, you got you you're so much more businessy than me <laughs> i'm just the guy who draws my <laughs> yeah i just like to draw but um uh, i just write off steven knowledge okay well there you go okay fair enough fair enough and istabrak when i spoke to istabrak uh we spoke in private before we got on the call both of us shared a very similar concern. We all share this concern, and that is the best interest of all of these younger artists. When it's something you said as well, Steve, is is this 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 frustration? This if you're in the throes of the most ambitious years of your life as a young artist who's putting way too much time and energy into it, it can be incredibly discouraging just to see a finished product like that and feel very discouraged. Um, um, what I would do. In, in light of this very diverse and very heavy conversation that we're experiencing here is don't take for granted the power of humanity in all of this, that humans have in most cases, at least ethical cases, we have, we have always behaved in the best interest of humanity. And the, the advancement of industry and the advancement of, of, the financial sector or anybody who wants to monetize or make make business decisions based off of the skills and the passions of other people has always been the adversary of humanity in that regard. It always has been. I mean, Tolkien's books were based off of that when he witnessed industry come in and destroy the natural world. We're facing another one of these realities and 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 these parties are still behaving in the way they always have. Yet here we are artists in 2023 who still very much believe in the human experience. And we're still here. We've all dedicated our lives to, as Neil deGrasse Tyson would say, dedicate our lives to reducing the suffering of others in our own capacity, right? That's That speaks for something. And if AI comes in and, and, and decides to strip us of the skill, the, the payable skill that we have, I think that as humans, or at least I'd like to believe as humans, that we will find a way to to rekindle that that appreciation and the value that we have in the human experience a couple of weeks ago we had an ice storm where my power was cut out for five days and it reminded me of an ice storm back in 1998 in eastern canada where we were cut out for months and wow. the, it reminded me again how very quickly how people come together in the face of tragedy. When the power's cut out, if you think about it objectively, because I've lived, lived through this twice, this whole conversation we're having right now, everything that we're talking about right now could be switched off like that. How? Flick the lights off. Cut electricity. As soon as there's a power outage, a long-term power outage, immediately realize that modern society as it exists today is all 
balancing on this little needle called electricity. That's it. And the moment you take that away, humanity immediately emerges from their homes. And all of a sudden, I'm meeting neighbors that I lived next to for 20 years, and I never even knew they existed. Why? Because they were plugged in yeah. front of a television for 20 years. So if and when AI comes in and says, you know what, we don't need you anymore, we'll take care of all this techie shit, well, then we'll, we will search for humanity, and we will find it in which by, by any means necessary. And if it destroys Absolutely. us, then we got nothing to worry about because we'll be dead, right? So <laughs> does anybody That's else a have a great note to was I sewed it up nicely? <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> uh, does anybody else have any final words, or uh, are we are we all falling asleep at this point? Uh, if I, I could say, say something. Oh, oh go, go ahead, ahead. Antonio. I'll go after you. Okay, yeah, that's better. You do the closing thought. I, I want to <laughs> say I want to say after um, that to everyone that's listening, young and impressionable artists, hobbyists, whoever's listening, please do not underestimate the absolute value of learning something. As an anecdote that I wanted to mention in this podcast is that I've picked up chess for the first time in my life mm. and computers have been beating people at chess for years already. Mm -hmm. Still, people love to learn how chess works. There's a lot of value in learning chess. It's absolutely wonderful. People still want to get professionals in it. So there's there's so much merit into learning something, getting just skills in something that might not be your profession, but there's still a lot of merit to it and it can help Absolutely. you, it can help you grow. So please do not interest, underestimate that. That's all I wanted to say. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Uh, anybody else? Um, yeah, if, um, yeah, it's it's a very wide ranging topic, so it's hard to uh, encapsulate, but um, I guess I basically want to say that uh, all of the things that we are proud of in our society, right? All of the advancements that we've made that we consider noble, right? And I'm, I'm, I'm going to go big just because it makes the point clear, not because I'm trying to draw a direct connection, but mm -hmm. the abolition of slavery, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Women's rights for voting, all of the things that we look back at, gay marriage, everything that we look back on and we're like, oh, it's good we did that. That makes our society more noble. We're all, we're all very proud of ourselves for doing that. And we consider that to be look, you know, we're working things out in society, everything like that. Just want to remind everyone, every one of those things was fought for. Mm -hmm. None yeah. of those things was something that we acquired by going, all right, let's just sit around and adapt. I guess we had to fight tooth and nail for these things that we now consider to be the absolute groundwork of an ethical society. Tooth and nail, we yeah. had to fight. So I don't think this is the time to just roll over in any capacity no. and give up. Um, and this happens to be one of the kinds of fights where you can do a little battle in this fight by drawing in your room. That's true. You, you get to engage. You can fight against the darkness. Every beautiful drawing is a slash against the enemy, is a little victory, right? So no one should stop <laughs> drawing. Everybody should keep going. No one knows how this is going to go but so do your little battles in your room keep drawing for the love of god and then also engage the big battle we have had to fight for every important thing in the societies that we are proud of all of them the status quo has always been a slow crawl towards mediocrity and darkness so we've got to push back and insist on humanistic values um beyond that philosophical point um I would advise people to go check out some of the GoFundMes that are out there if any of yep. this has inspired you to try to throw in for the fight. So the Concept Art Association has a GoFundMe called the Protecting Artists from AI Technologies GoFundMe. It has a lot of money in it right now, $255,000 about. It's going for a $270,000 goal. Consider donating. Um, I want to do full disclosure. When I first started talking about that GoFundMe, I had nothing to do with it. I was just promoting something other people were doing. Full disclosure. Since then, they have asked me to engage in some right. of the meetings that they have locked down with representatives and stuff like that. So I just want to put that out there that, you know, that for anybody to know that I, I was promoting that before I had anything to do with it. But and I now want to be clear, I'm promoting it and I do have something to do with it. Now I okay. am going to be one of I'll the I'll link it below. I'll share talking. the links with me. I'll share all of that below for sure. Yeah. yeah. Steven, there's I also think a, everybody, there's, you're the one who we would want speaking on our behalf about that anyway. So I'm very glad to hear that. 
Yeah, so I'm, I'm humbled to hear that. Truly, I just want to have as, that out there clear for people. As soon as you said slash, every time you make a slash with your breaststroke, I immediately thought of Death Note. You know, so every time an artist yeah. makes a mark, they would <laughs> delete, delete. You know? Nice, like, it's dramatic. Nice. I, I do also, I do also quickly want to mention that uh, in the EU, EGAR, which is an organization that was assembled to, similar to the what the Concept Art Association is doing. Yeah. Um, they also have a GoFundMe that you can find. It's called Help Protect Our Art and Data from AI Companies um, by through Mifu, which is a founding member of eGear. If you're in the EU, that would be the one to look at. I consider that very important because like I mentioned earlier, I think uh, the EU's legal system sets a lot of precedent for legal systems elsewhere in the world. So I think that's very significant. So I just want to throw those out no, there. No, no, thank you so much. That's, that's fantastic. Uh, yeah, and Kelsey, any any closing words for today? No, I mean, Stephen like ended it really well. Yeah, I have nothing else to add. He, he's the, the the mental mental dictionary. <laughs> and and Istabrak, how about you? Um, I'm mostly concerned with like the sense of doom that a listener might yeah. uh, have after uh, you know this entire discussion. They might feel that. Uh, from all fronts, you know, what's my skill? What's my worth? What's going on in the world? How much can I really change? I'm thinking about like the small beginner broke artist who doesn't even have $20 to, to put into the charity or the GoFundMe. Um, yeah. My message to them is that uh, even if AI took over the world and all our art was, it was just no longer required, you would still have that desire to draw. It doesn't yeah. take away the desire to draw. It just replaces the financial value of your of your ability to draw, meaning mm -hmm. that it just you're not going to get hired. Or well, that's this real like that's the extreme of it. But you're still going to want to draw. You're still going to have this passion, this stirring of wanting to put paint on canvas. Um, so it, it it your identity isn't in crisis. Your your journey is still valid. Um, the sense of fear you may have or intimidation, all of that. Though we're talking about something extremely serious, your journey should still go on as expected. You should still be doing everything you were going to do tomorrow and the day after. You'll make a mistake in that drawing and you'll get a critique on it. And you're going to you know, learn from that critique and you just have to believe in that process that you, you will find yourself, as, James, as, as Stephen says, you'll find yourself in the process. So uh, don't forfeit, don't be freaked out, don't be scared. This is a big discussion, but it doesn't mean that your journey is, there's a there's a timer on it. The, you, you are still expected and the universe still expects you to put paint on paper. Yeah, you know, and, uh, and, uh, and to take what you just said and to reflect on something Antonio said as well, where he was picking up chess. I love chess too, by the way. I was a huge fan growing mm -hmm. up. Um, I, uh, I realized I was sitting and I was writing something and I realized my handwriting has completely gone to shit. I've gotten to you, you <laughs> type for so long. I've been typing for so many years. I, I took it for granted. So I decided exactly the same way you did to take up calligraphy for the first time in my life. And nice. um, what calligraphy teaches you is that the value of a, the mastery and the value of the of human creation is not measured by its speed and efficiency. It's measured by its thoughtfulness. It's measured by its, mm -hmm. by the care that you put into it. And the first thing you live in, uh, you learn in calligraphy is the same thing I learned from, you know, the teachings of Bobby Chu when he teaches art as well. It's about slowing down, right? Mm -hmm. Calligraphy isn't about writing like this. Calligraphy is about thoughtfulness of every single brushstroke. That is, mm -hmm. that is anti-efficiency. That is mastery. It's putting love into your craft, and. I don't see that going anywhere anytime soon. The feeling of the, the, yeah. the love of finding a new pen and the weight of the pen in your hand and the texture of the paper and making that mark yes. and controlling the entire gesture is the pleasure. It has nothing to do with writing something fast and typing it out. So take mm -hmm. pride in that. Take joy in that. I watch Steven Zapata drawing all the time. You know, he takes his sweet ass time. Like uh, as Harry Connick Jr. would say, I don't have time to hurry. <laughs> I don't have enough time to hurry. Wow, that's right? amazing. Yeah, and and in that respect, that's where where all of us are saying, just keep drawing, just keep enjoying and loving what you do, and take your time and put your yes. love and put your thoughtfulness into it, and you'll have nothing to worry about in that regard until the meteor hits, and then we're all doomed. All right, <laughs> sound good, guys? 
All right. Great. Thank you so much for having us, Adam. This was great. Nice talking to you. Thanks. Uh, yes, it was great. Run us over. You guys are all absolutely fantastic. Thank you.